गुड इवनिंग सर पाई सर हेलो आई एम ऑल्सो देर प्लीज म्यूट एवरी वन Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Rohan Palshetkar, the National Coordinator of the Foxy Youth Talent Promotion Committee. We bring to you today a female fertility management, a masterclass with the Foxy stalwarts. This program is conducted by Dr. Niharika Malotra, the chairperson of the Female Fertility Management, uh, chairperson of the Foxy Young Talent Promotion Committee. Today we have a dearth of stalwarts today. We have Dr. Shanta Kumari, ma'am, who's our chief guest and president of the Foxy. We also have Dr. Jaydeep Malotra and Dr. Rishikesh Pai, who are the guest of honors. We have a fantastic session with Dr. Nandita Palshikar, Dr. Jatin Shah, and Dr. Sanjeeva Reddy, sir, giving lectures on various topics. We also have Dr. Sunita, Dr. Parikshit, and Dr. Narendra Malotra, sir, as well, who are talking on innovations in the field. so without taking too much time i'd like to begin with the coordinators uh, of the program first i'd like to introduce dr niharika malotra who's the chairperson of the young talent promotion committee dr niharika malotra can i please have a cv yeah she's an md gold medalist she's a consultant at rainbow ivf and as you can see she has won a lot of awards if i start reading them i think it'll be really difficult for me to get through each and every one of them So Niharika, thank you for this opportunity, and I also have to thank Shanta, ma'am, and Madhuri Patel, ma'am, for giving us this opportunity as well. Our other program coordinators and who are the most active members of the U, uh, Young Talent Promotion Committee, Dr. Shaila Jamal, may I please have a CV? Yeah. So she's an associate professor at the RMRI Bareilly. She's the founder and president of the Society of Menstrual Disorders and Hygiene Management. She's the India Book of Records holder. a joint secretary of gnogs and she's a chief editor of the journal of reproductive and menstrual sciences our next coordinator is dr rohan palshetkar thank you uh, can i have the next slide please dr priyankur roy he's an assistant professor at the lord buddha koshi medical college and hospital the sahasa consulting in fertility and gynec endoscopy royce clinic and nova ivf siriguri He is also the Joint Secretary of Siriguri OBGYN Society, the Vice President of Watog, and the National Coordinator of the Public Awareness Committee of Foxy. May I have the next slide? Other coordinator is Dr. Prerna Keshan. She is a consultant OBGYN, infertility specialist, and endoscopic surgeon at Horizon Maternity and Fertility Clinic at Tinsukila, uh, Assam. She is trained in reproductive medicine at IRM Kolkata. She is the chairperson of the IMA Mission Pink Health Assam, chairperson of the IMA ASB Swayam Project, and the state coordinator for the IMA Assam Safe Motherhood Committee as well. And Dr. Anshu Basair, she is an MS OBGYN consultant at the Akash Hospital and Diagnostic Center in Dhod. She has published papers in national and international journals. She has co-authored the book on ultrasound for beginners. And Anshu, we are all looking forward to coming to Indore for the AICOG. So we are looking forward to hosting you as well. Without taking too much time, I'd like to request Dr. Uh, Shaila Jamal to please introduce our chief guest. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rohan, and taking permission from all the organizers. <laughs> May I have the privilege of inviting and introducing our chief guest for today, Dr. Shanta Kumari, ma'am. She is commander in chief of the Foxing Gynecologist across the nation. She is treasurer, eco initiator, pioneer, hero. We know her for her dynamism, 
ma'am we look forward for Ravi, can you please mute everyone except for Shanta, ma'am? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. I, I think there's a lot of crosstalk which is happening. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, just a second. Uh, Ravi ji, please mute uh, one with faculty name. May I request everyone to please mute them? Someone has got a webinar going side by side. Yes. Tonal, can you uh, help us in this, please? Tonal, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. No, it's... Only Ravi is the host, so he can only do it. Yeah, it's done now. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am. Shanta, ma'am, please unmute, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, Shanta, ma'am, please unmute. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So we know there are some disturbances when we have physical conferences. So online also to give us an uh, feeling that we are in a meeting. So these are the small technical things which happen, at least to make us feel connected. So congratulations to the Young Talent Promotion Committee and all the coordinators are doing a good job. Rohan, uh, Priyankur, Shela and all the young Turks. Niharika, you've got a good team. and I'm very happy that uh, you're trying to do uh, good work now. Yeah, it's nice to be a part of this webinar, but I think now things are getting back to normal. I am hoping and looking forward to all my chairpersons getting onto the field from from the online to the physical format. And uh, I'm sure this will go a long way in uh, making all Foxians, I think, connect to each other more. We have had uh, two years, difficult years, and we are really looking forward to connecting with uh, each other. I see Dr. Narendra Malhotra, I think the most busiest Foxy, uh, Foxy president, I see, he's an eternal Foxy president and full of life and energy. So we all love you, sir, and it's nice to see you online and always ever smiling, full of energy. Thank you for uh, being there and guiding us. And uh, I'm sure that now you'll be able to guide the youngsters to go from online to offline mode of uh, meetings. So wish you all the best, Niharika and the whole team. I Thank see you, in Rishikesh is also there, uh, but now I can't find him. I'm on the actually in the car, so I'm not able to locate everyone. So, uh, hello and wishes to all who are there today with us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Over to you, Dr. Rohan. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to invite our next guest of honor, Dr. Jaydeep Malhotra, ma'am, the past president of Foxy. May I just request you to please play her CV? Before you that you say that, I couldn't see Jaydeep. Hello, Jaydeep. Yeah, hi Shanta. I can't see you. Sorry, on the phone. I think I'm, my, uh, I'm, I'm only seeing you in the car in the last so many webinars now. Great. What? Keep doing the good work. Yeah, I'm on the way to the office actually now. Oh, oh wow. Wow. Bye. Uh, Ravi, may I just have Jaydeep Malhotra, ma'am? Yeah, thank you so much. So I don't think there's much to say about Jaydeep Madhotra, ma'am. I think everyone knows her throughout India as well. But I do still have to give a formal introduction for Jaydeep, ma'am. So she's the managing director of ART Rainbow IVF. She's been the uh, she's the vice president of the Indian Society of Aesthetic and Regenerative Gynecology, the chair of the FIGO Committee of Reproductive Medicine, Endocrinology and Infertility, immediate past president of the South Asian Federation of Menopause Society and ISPAT, Regional Director of the South Asia Ian Donald School of Ultrasound, Professor Dubrunovic International University, Croatia, past member of FIGO Working Group on RDEH, member of the Accountability Group of PMNCH, WHO. She's the Editor-in-Chief of Suffolk and Suffolk's Journals and many books, President Rotary Club of Agra Grace, past President of Foxy, Isar, Aspire, IMS, past Secretary and Vice Chairperson of ICOG, She's also got a lot of awards, like the recipient of the honorary FRCOG and FRCPI, recipient of the Nepal Saman, Lifetime Achievement Award of the IS, ISSRF, DLA Woman of the Year, 
Amar Ujla Gaurav Samman Award, India Book of Records and World Records of India Awards, Economic Times Most Inspiring Women Award, the Swayam Siddha uh, Award by the Honorary, Honorary Governor of UP, Sri Ram Nayak Ji, the Indumati Zaveri Prize, the MD Hansotia Be Award Best Committee, the Jagdishwari Mishra Award three times, the Korean Award, the Forbes Most Successful Woman. She's been credited with the first 500 IVF babies of Nepal, the first IVF ICSI TISA twins of UP. She's the advisor to the Maulana Azad Medical College, Delhi, JNMC, Aligarh, SMS College, Jaipur. She's the initiator of Club 35 Plus, Adbhut Matrita, and the IMAMS app. Ma'am, I know that there are a lot more things to your CV. I know it must have been a task to shorten it out. But ma'am, over to you. We'd love to hear some inspiring words. Rohan, I think it was already decided that we are not going to waste time on reading the CVs. I, I it's mean, it's, it's difficult, ma'am, with you then. Subjects are very important. Thank you so much uh, for, uh, you know, reading it all out. Um, but my heartiest congratulations to each and every one of you. I mean, it's unbelievable how um, proud I feel today uh, with all of you youngsters at the helm of affairs and doing such a great job. Amazing. God bless you all, the young Turks of Foxy. Foxy has great future. And this topic today, Niharika, I'm very proud of you again because nutrition, and manipulation at nutritional levels is the key for future management of disease and prevention of disease uh, for tomorrow. And uh, I'm very, very happy today that, you know, all of you have started working on this aspect uh, right away. So uh, really looking forward to all the wonderful uh, speakers you have chosen. I think you guys are very, very lucky to get all the great speakers who are great academicians and, you know, very, very knowledgeable about the subject and so pro everything what is new. So all the best. Um, keep the good work going. Very, very proud feeling today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, thank you for the inspiring words and Niharika, you're always a great leader and it's great to see you at the helm of things. Shaila, over to you uh, to introduce our next guest of honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jadeep, ma'am. Uh, now we have uh, none other than Dr. Rishikesh Pai, sir. Sir is president-elect Foxy and sir, on behalf of all the young team, as we are called, the whole fraternity is looking forward to work under your guidance. Thank you for adding to our blessings that we have received today. Thank you so much for coming over here and blessing us. And as a customary, please allow me to read a few words from your CV as well. Just a few sir, words. Huh? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> sir is medical director, Bloom IVF Group, already uh, announced president-elect of Foxy, administrative, uh, administrator of Foxy Manita Initiative, director Corporate Affairs, IFFS, International Federation of Fertility Societies. He is adjunct assistant professor at Eastern Virginia Medical School, USA, PG teacher in gynecology at DNB examination uh, centers all across India. His special interest, we all know, sir, infertility, endoscopy, IVF, ICSI, egg freezing, genetics, you are the pioneer. And the dais is all yours, sir. We are waiting. Thank you. No, I, I am just waiting. First of all, let me congratulate Niharika. You know, uh, see, all of the future Foxy presidents are all here. I can see many of them. Niharika, Malotraya, then the, her team of Sela and uh, Priyankur, Rohan, and uh, others. I can see even Ameya Purandare there in the this thing. And uh, all my the stalwart like uh, Jatin, Nandita, uh, then uh, my uh, the, the Malotras, the Foxy couple, the power couple, Narendra and Jaiti uh, Malotra and uh, Dr. Nandita is very, I don't know whether she has joined us from Egypt or not. Sanjeeva Reddy, my good friend. Uh, and a lot of people, pardon me if I'm, you know, not seen record. I can't see everyone. Of course, our president, Santa Kumari. So basically, I don't want to take much time. I just want to say that the India, fortunately for us, we did go for the one child family norm like the Chinese did. Now the Chinese population is aging a lot. And fortunately for us, our population is very young. 
So you know, in fact, I, uh, the other day Rishma and we were discussing, and she was telling me that in China they started encouraging three-child family again because they need more people. So uh, in the next fifty years, they are the fifty years of India with all of you youngsters in that uh, in the role of developing the country, and I think with the internet will probably capture the whole world also. So you know. Because, uh, you know, I would say that our civilization is very old, and what we have learned is tolerance. We have been there for many years, many centuries. So all that makes a difference ultimately. So thank you very much for calling me here, and we are looking forward to hearing for the great from the great stalwarts of infidelity. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank uh, you so much. yeah. Yes. Uh, so, I, Dr. Neharika, do we have the permission to carry uh, forward the yes, session? Yes, let's begin our scientific session now. So, over to you, uh, Priyankur. Thank you. Thank you, Shela and Rohan. Uh, thanks to Shantakumari ma'am, Jaideep ma'am, and Rishikesh sir for gracing the occasion. And so, first of all, to start off with the session with the chairperson, so I would like to uh, invite uh, my fellow coordinator, Dr. Prerna, to kindly take over, please. Thank you, Priyankur, and what a star-studded evening this is. We are extremely honored to have such pertinent speakers with us today. And uh, to invite our first chairperson to the dais, I would like to ask, uh, please, uh, please, Dr. Archana Basair, ma'am, CV, please. Yes, uh, uh, we are very glad that ma'am is here with us today. Uh, she has been the Vice President FOXI 2020 and Organizing Secretary of AICOG 2021. She's a consultant OBGYN Director at uh, Akash Hospital Indore and uh, had past positions as Chairperson FOXI Imaging Science Committee and Organizing Secretary SAR 2016. Uh, we are very, very glad to have you amongst us, ma'am. Uh, kindly uh, chair the dais, ma'am. And uh, a second uh, uh, chairperson for the evening is uh, Professor Girja Wag, ma'am. And ma'am is so dear to all of us here. Uh, she's a professor, Department of OBGYN, Bharti Vidya Peet Medical College, Pune, and a senior consultant at Cloud9 and Opal Hospitals, Pune. Ma'am, uh, we are extremely honored that you have accepted the invitation to chair the session. And uh, for the introduction of the next two chairs, I would like to invite Priyanko to kindly do the need poll. Thank you, Prerna. So now I would like to introduce uh, another stalwart uh, in Apoxy, Dr. Amaya Purandare, sir. He is a consultant at the Purandare Hospital and the uh, HN Reliance Bhartia Masina, uh, Masina and the Mumbai Public Hospital. Uh, he, has, he is the second vice president-elect of Amox, joint secretary of Foxy, and has been the chairperson of the Food Drug Medical, Medical Surgical Equipment Committee of Foxy. Welcome, sir. And we have also with us Dr. Aruna Suman Man to chair this session. She is a professor OBGYN at the Government Medical College in Telangana. She is the president of the OGSH and the Joint Secretary of Foxy 2021-22, brilliantly working there and keeping us all in the loop in whatever she is doing. So thank you so much, ma'am, for being here in spite of your busy schedule. So now I would like to invite Dr. Archana Basir, ma'am, to kindly invite our first speaker, Dr. Nandita Palseskar, ma'am, for her talk on understanding the role of uh, nutraceuticals in infertility. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, let me thank and congratulate Dr. Niharika for a very focused uh, subject webinar uh, that is nutraceuticals in infertility. And I'm really, it is my proud privilege to be amongst the five presidents of Foxy and five fellow vice presidents of Foxy today. It is really a star studded evening and all the, you know, like very energetic and very, very vibrant uh, Foxy members are here and all position holders are here. So it's really going to be a great uh, evening with a lot of, uh, you know, learning on one topic. And it is really indeed a great, uh, you know, privilege to read out CV of a great friend and a great human being, Dr. Nandita Palchetikar. I think, you know, there are so many laurels to Nandita's credit. I think you can really spend whole day reading it, but there are few points which I'm going to highlight. The first and the foremost is she, she is queen of hearts. Wherever she goes, she wins hearts. So that is the most important quality of uh, Nandita. And, uh, uh, to read about her laurels. She's director at nine Bloom IVF centers, professor in OBGYN at D.Y. Patil Medical College, Navi Mumbai, teacher for super specialty degree, FNB reproductive medicine. She's practicing infertility for the last 
uh, more than 25 years, President Emox, former President Foxy, former President Emojis, she has been president of IAG, she is vice president of ISAR, and she's former chairperson MSR, and she has written more than 150 chapters, received 18 awards, delivered 61 orations, and I think she has delivered more than 1,000 talks. She's recipient of Bharat Gaurav Award and recipient of IMA Award for contribution towards medical field, recipient of IMA Empowered Women Award 2019, and Frost and Sullivan Best Practices Award for IVF in 2013 and Women Super Achiever Award 2019. So here, I uh, really am very happy that Nandita will be joining us. I think I'm sure she has joined from Egypt as I understood. So uh, Nandita, the podium is for you. By the time Nandita is joining, let me invite you all to indoor for AICOG 2022. Uh, this nutraceuticals has been there for a long, long time. But, you know, sometimes it comes to the fore, sometimes it goes back. But I think now is the time when nutraceuticals are going to take center stage. It is prime time for them. And we need to understand because medicine is really changing. You know, everything is being related to food and medical and nutritional therapy has become a science now, which is well established. So if you look at what is a nutraceutical, it's a combination of two words, which is nutrient and pharmaceutical. And uh, we know nutrient means something that nourishes the body and pharmaceutical is a medical drug. So a nutraceutical must be derived from a food source and of course, offer additional health benefits beyond general basic nutrition. So let us look at the different examples. You know, carotenoids like lycopene, natural antioxidants that we have, vitamin C, tocopherols, dietary enzymes, proteins, amino acids, mineral supplements, phytonutrients, prebiotic, probiotic supplements, dietary fiber supplements, vitamin supplements, and of course, don't forget our very own herbal products like turmeric, alma, shat amla, shatavri, ashwagandha, ashoka, neem. I remember my grandmother, uh, you know, feeding us all these things. We had a cough, she would give turmeric with milk. You know, there's so many uh, uh, you know, health benefits, which we are now realizing and utilizing it in modern science. So what about fertility? I think we know we need antioxidants. We have mitochondrial energy enhancers, proteins and amino acids, minerals and vitamins, herbs and phytonutrients, prebiotics and postbiotics. And we all know that somehow all these drugs you know, in some way or the other, help in the complex process of reproduction. Free radicals is something that is, you know, we talk about it so simply, but what exactly are they? They are highly reactive metabolites that are naturally produced by the body as a result of normal metabolism and energy production. And a certain amount is actually needed, needed in the body. These are your body's natural biological response to environmental toxins, like you can see in the diagram, you know, uh, cigarette smoke, sunlight, chemicals, cosmic, as well as man-made radiation. Free radicals can be produced when you exercise and have inflammation anywhere in your body. And even they are a key feature of pharmaceutical drugs. So these free radicals, what do what is their mechanism of action? They usually have an unpaired electron that's responsible for the biological oxidation. So they're missing one or more electrons. These incomplete molecules aggressively attack other molecules to replace the missing parts and in what's known as oxidation reactions. Free radicals wreak havoc in your body by stealing electrons from proteins. And what this does is this damages your DNA and other cell structures. So when proteins are damaged, DNA, other cell structures, and not only that, it leads to a snowball effect 
So as the molecules steal from one another, each one becomes a new free radical and this leaves a trail of biological carnage. And this is what we need to understand. So what is their role? So it antioxidants, what do they do? What is their role in combating free radicals? Simple, the electrons which are missing, they act as electron donors that help combat free radicals. Antioxidants break the free radical chain reaction in your body by sacrificing their own electrons to feed free radicals. And remember, they don't turn into free radicals themselves when they've donated that electron. And that is where the chain, that carnage, biological carnage actually stops. So antioxidants are nature's way of providing your cells with a defense or a shield effect against attacks by reactive oxygen species or the free radicals. You know, in the days of, uh, I mean, in this COVID, we know how vaccine protects us. And so remember, antioxidants is your shield or protection against even aging. If your body has substantial amounts of antioxidants, it may resist aging triggered by everyday exposure to pollutants and other free radical triggering substances. Oxidative stress. We know that a certain amount of ROS is beneficial for the progression of normal cell functions. And this, of course, includes our reproductive cells and tissue. So when does oxidative stress result? when the level of the reactive oxygen species or the free radical exceeds the capacity of the antioxidants to neutralize a certain amount of ROS is beneficial for the progression of normal cell functions. And that includes obviously reproductive cells and tissues. So what is oxidative stress? Oxidative stress results when the level of those reactive oxygen species exceeds the capacity of the antioxidants to neutralize them. And it describes when a system has an imbalance between oxidation and reduction reactions, leading to generation of excess oxidants or molecules. These are the molecules that accept electrons from another reactant. Failure to have an adequate supply of antioxidants can lead to higher risk of oxidative stress and cause, can cause accelerated tissue and organ damage. Let's look at male infertility oxygen ions, free radicals, peroxides are generally generated by sperm, seminal leukocytes within the semen. And these produce infertility by two key mechanisms. First, they damage the sperm membrane. So obviously they decrease the sperm motility and its ability to fuse with the oocyte. Second, they can also go in and alter the sperm DNA, resulting in the passage of defective paternal DNA to the conceptus. So high levels of ROS are detected in semen samples of infertile men. And that is why we'd like to give antioxidants to most of the men empirically. But now research is showing that it is needed in certain men. What about the reactive oxygen species in female infertility? Reactive oxygen species affects multiple physiological processes, right from oocyte maturation to fertilization to embryo development and even pregnancy. You know, it has been suggested that even the age-related decline in fertility is actually modulated by oxidative stress. We all are seeing a lot of young girls with low AMH. I feel stress, pollution. Uh, you know, all these factors are adding to this decline in fertility in young girls. It plays a role even during pregnancy and normal parturition and in initiation of preterm labor. Oxidative stress plays a role in pathophysiology of infertility and assisted fertility. There is some evidence of its role even in endometriosis, tubal and peritoneal factor infertility and unexplained infertility. So what are the commonly used antioxidants we use in our practice? CoQ10 or ubiquinol, astaxanthin, glutathione or its precursor NAC, ALA, selenium, lycopene, vitamin C, zinc, other vitamins, vitamin E, uh, herbs and phytonutrients in fertility, uh, shilajit, shatavri, arjuna, ashwagandha, giloy, turmeric, res resveterol, spirulina, ginseng, and many more. 
And remember that they have multiple roles. They are antioxidants, they are micronutrients. So we must use these to help our patients. Nutraceuticals to improve mitochondrial energy. The human body requires coenzyme 10 to produce energy. A small component of the human cell called the mitochondria is home for the synthesis of adenosine triphosphate. ATP is the primary coenzyme used for the production of energy. Without CoQ10, ATP is unable to be synthesized and therefore energy cannot be produced. Ubiquinone is a reduced form and more available form of CoQ10. With age or certain conditions, the levels of CoQ10 come down and also the body ability to convert CoQ10 into ubiquinol also reduces. What about the proteins? Protein deficiency is one of the causes of insulin resistance or PCOS. Protein is also crucial when managing PCOS. Aside from supporting muscle growth, metabolism, and providing sustained energy, proteins also help in regulating blood sugar, insulin production, and they control weight. Whole plant-based proteins have a number of advantages over animal proteins. They are free of cholesterol, saturated fats, high in fiber, vitamins, minerals, fibers, and essential amino acids. They are also free from residual hormones which may be present in animal proteins. Look at the, let's look at the next group, vitamins. Deficiency of vitamins or micronutrients is one of the root causes of the most internal diseases including infertility. Some of the key vitamins or micronutrient supplements are vitamin B, C, D, E. Of course, folic acid, minerals like zinc, magnesium, calcium, iron, selenium, inositols, multivitamins, amino acids like arginine, leu leucine, carnitine. All these vitamins and micronutrients are necessary for prevention of infertility. Probiotics and prebiotics. I think fertility and gut health. It is very important now. There is a change in the whole thinking that the inflammation or the gut health, the bacilli which are there, are actually the some of the reasons why we get these chronic diseases. And so, a healthy microbiome supports a hormone balance. A healthy gut is essential for reducing vaginal infections. A healthy vaginal microbiome increases the likelihood of conception. And of course, a healthy gut supports a healthy weight. So all these factors are very important. The hormone balance, the vaginal infections, the vagina, healthy vagina and the healthy weight is required for, infertil for fertility. So probiotics introduce new healthy bacteria into the gut. And prebiotics are the food that those healthy bacteria need to thrive. So in short, a healthy gut and vaginal microbiome are key for overall health including fertility health. Think of taking it as, you know, as a proactive approach to better reproductive health. So the probiotics are, you know, lap lactobacillus rhamnosus, bifidobacterium bifidum, lactobacillus lactis, bifido. The prebiotics are oligofructose, inulin, lactulose, gal galacto-oligosaccharides. So all these are necessary. Another very important part of your diet is dietary fibers. There are two types, water soluble and water insoluble. Recommended uh, daily intake is about 30 to 40 grams, whole grain cereals, oats, legumes, dried beans, etc. In fact, flaxseed, isabgol, etc. are good supplements to add fiber to your diet. And it helps you, really keeps you healthy. Importance of nutraceuticals, most internal diseases are caused by oxidative stress and deficiency of nutrients and micronutrients. And this is a known fact today, and it is backed by evidence. These can be tackled by nutraceuticals, which have relatively less side effects as compared to pharmaceuticals. Safety has been established as they've been used since ages. Let food be your medicine instead of medicine becoming your food. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nandita.
for really enlightening on role of nutraceutical i think it it's a very basic thing you know which we have been uh, missing out in our daily practice like dietary advice and nutraceutical are becoming very very important and they are important anyways but we have come to know about their importance now so it was a really excellent talk um, by you uh, can we take any questions or we have to go ahead dr niharika and we will take questions after the session one gets over okay so thank you uh, nandita for uh, your presentation and really enjoyed your talk Um, uh, for that uh, comments, uh, Girija ma'am, uh, can I invite you for a couple of comments, please, before we yes. take on the next talk, please? Yeah, uh, wonderful uh, talk by as you, always by Dr. Nandita, and I think it's a good learning for all of us that one of the most important things before we embark upon pregnancy is to optimize woman's nutritional needs, her practices, and that will definitely help us in bringing about better results and such wonderful things that she mentioned about. So we have to now not waste more time and go ahead with our uh, session because I'm sure all of us. Thank you, Girija ma'am, for those wonderful comments. Uh, now can I request our chairperson, Dr. Amaya Purandare sir, to kindly introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jatin Shah sir, for his talk on poor, mm -hmm. poor responders and nutraceuticals. Thank you, Priyankur. First of all, congratulations to... Uh, Niharika and the Young Talent Promotion Committee for an excellent webinar on very, very important topics by none other than the stalwarts of uh, infertility in India. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker and that is none other than the superstar of IVF in India, Dr. Jatin Shah. Dr. Jatin Shah is the director of the Mumbai Fertility Clinic and IVF Center. He has helped establish more than 20,000 IVF pregnancies over three decades of ART practice and pioneered the setup of IVF centers and batch IVF 25 years ago. He has had to his credit more than 500 international and national presentations, keynotes, guest lectures and webinars. Dr. Shah has been awarded with numerous prestigious awards like the Adidas Tour, CN Purandare, Dr. Indumati Javeri Prizes, the JC's Young Personality of the Year, the top docs of Mumbai by India today. He is the founder member of Aspire and has contributed numerous text chapters and publications in esteemed journals. His research interests include failed IVF, implantation, obstetric outcomes in ART, progesterone levels, frozen transfers, the use of GSF, PRP for RIF and third party ART. Over to Dr. Shah, we are really looking forward to listening from you. Uh, can you can I share my screen, please? Stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, dearest Ameya. It's indeed an honor to be in the midst of a galaxy of all my best friends and all the who's who of ART and OBGYN in India. It's indeed an honor and what gives me immense happiness is to see Neharika, uh, you know, I've seen her a tiny tot, a little more than a tiny tot as a teen with all the acne and everything and we used to play around in Agra and to see her, Rohan and Keshav blossoming into this wonderful present and future of Indian OBGYN and IVF is absolutely just very, very fulfilling and gives me a lot of happiness. Why today's talk is very, very important is because, you know, with the new ART Act now, Maybe it's a blessing in disguise that we have to now, you know, not do too much of oocyte donations because that's going to be more and more difficult. So we have to find new ways and means of restoring oocyte competency. And what do we mean by this? That we have to try and counter the effects of aging, the effects of oxidative stress, and all the various things that we heard of in the previous presentation by the use of what we call now as nutraceuticals. But of course, we need to know first what is the available evidence for the use of these various uh, molecules that we have. We know that poor ovarian responders is of course a huge epidemic now. Most of you will agree that almost 50% of our patients are fall in either Poseidons 1, 2, 3 and 4 and are the most challenging patients to treat. Also, we know that oocyte competency is the main key to embryo potential. We know that the oocyte transmits not only the mother's nuclear uh, and genetic material, but also her mitochondrial genome to the embryo and mitochondrial DNA is known 
to be especially susceptible to the aging effects. You're all familiar with these statistics that a woman starts off with a million eggs at birth. And then of course, there are just about 25,000 left by the age of 37. But remember that only 300 or 400 eggs actually have the ability to form a baby. And what happens with aging? It triggers off a series of molecular alterations, which are not only because of aging, but also because of the effects of ROS and various oxidative processes, which result in chromatid separation, chromosome decondensation, spindle detachments, and so on. And therefore, you end up with poor outcomes with your IVF. We know that increased DNA damage is usually due to less active DNA repair machinery. And this is where all our antioxidants and ubiquinols come into play because this is the level at which they act. Remember that the oocyte maturation is one of the most dynamic cells in the body comparable to a heart cell, which has to keep pumping for all our lives. And all these processes require a lot of energy, which is provided by mitochondria. So any kind of mitochondrial malfunction is what causes arrest of oocyte maturation, chromosomal misalignments, and compromised embryo development. Very interesting fact here that as follicles get recruited, the mitochondrial DNA increases from 6,000 copies to 2 lakh copies. And this is, you can imagine, much, much higher than the 5,000 mitochondria that are found in a typical heart muscle cell, which needs a constant energy supply for heart contraction. And because of this increase of copies, it makes it vulnerable to mutations and deletions. Also, chromosomal abnormalities can cause, of course, we all know uh, chemical pregnancies, miscarriages, and so on. And this is all much more likely when the actual driving engine of the egg cells is old or is low on energy. And that is why we are all familiar that with increasing age, you need more and more number of oocytes to give you that one normal euploid embryo, which could give a take-home baby. So let's focus on the actual topic for today, and that is what evidence do we have about the use of these nutraceuticals and adjuvants to actually improve egg and embryo quality in this difficult group of patients. Of course, first we'll quickly go through what we know, and that is the effect of androgens. We know that androgen receptor expression occurs at various stages of uh, follicular development, and it is very important to have a good endogenous androgen testosterone level to stimulate final leucite maturation, uh, give you proper ovulation rates, good corpora lutea, increase the granulosa cells, and so on. We also know for sure that testosterone levels decrease in women with advancing age. We had a lot of adjuvant therapies, and Amazon and the market were flooded with a whole range of products containing one of our favorite molecules in the past, and that was DHEA. Although it came with a bang, a lot of RCTs later showed that the current evidence on the effectiveness of DHEA is rather low, and maybe it does not support its routine use in poor responders, although a lot of us still continue to use it. What seems to be more promising is, of course, testosterone direct use rather than indirectly through DHEA. And we had a lot of studies that testosterone pretreatment for three to four weeks would increase your ovarian response. And further studies in 2017, 2019, all showing a lot of benefit with the use of pre-stimulation testosterone for some duration of time. So most of us were giving it for about 21 days before starting ovarian stimulation. But if you actually look at physiology, although most of the studies you can see here are of 21 days, the actual time for conversion of secondary to antral follicle is more than two months. That is almost 71 days. So if you actually really want to study the effect of testosterone, it needs to be given for 60 days in a dose, which would not cause any too much of hyperandrogenic side effects. And that is why we are awaiting the uh, results of the T trial, the transport trial, T transport trial, where they give testosterone for 60 days pre-stimulation and then do the long agonist protocol with HMG. And initial reports seem to be very encouraging with this. Letrozole, of course, is another androgen modulating agent. And here you have a wonderful study where you give five milligram letrozole from day one of stimulation until the trigger day, means along with the gonadotropins. And they found a lot of advantages. You have lower E2 levels, which are particularly useful because you avoid supraphysiology E2, which could affect endometrial receptivity. You get significantly higher number of oocytes, M2s, 2PN embryos, top quality embryos, and therefore higher clinical pregnancy rates. Growth hormone also came with a bang, a lot of studies in favor and against. Finally, Rob Norman did a proper analysis and he concluded there was no significant difference in live birth rate 
so to use such an expensive hormone may not really be justified in all situations vitamin d in adjuvants again enough evidence that significantly lower live birth rate in women with deficient vitamin d levels as compared to normal vitamin d and also we know that we all like to add zinc to our supplements because that too is beneficial for meiotic competence of the oocytes l carnitine again studied intensively by ashok agarwal 2018 especially its acetylated form acetyl l carnitine which has immense ability to regulate oxidative and metabolic status of the female reproductive system which is vulnerable particularly vulnerable to free radicals and therefore have good antioxidant properties but one of the main molecules which we all really want to focus on and that is ubiquinol for poor responders we know that there is naturally occurring ubiquinol in the body but a lot of factors contribute to the depletion of this naturally occurring ubiquinol and what exactly is that advancing maternal age metabolic demand oxidative stress and of course the stress and strain of modern lifestyle and you can see here so many endogenous uh, causes for release of reactive oxygen species even during the ivf procedure something as simple as a very intense microscope light or a very uh, uh, strong centrifugation freezing thawing culture media exposure to the atmosphere fluctuations of ph temperature all can cause release of ros and these free radicals would then contribute to dna damage in the sperm poor oocyte quality abnormal fertilization and defective embryo development it's such a nice slide to see the vicious cycle which exists between oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction so we know that oxidative stress will cause mitochondrial damage and finally it all boils down to mitochondria so the whole uh, focus of our next generation has to be on mitochondrial health of the aged oocyte so mitochondrial damage in turn will cause reduced mitochondrial function lower atp availability and lower antioxidant capacity higher ros production oxidative stress and more mitochondrial damage and this just goes on and on we know that coq10 is endogenously synthesized in all human tissues but a lot of factors could cause insufficient levels the main point being again that the age related decline in oocyte quality is not only genetic but you also an aneuploidies but also increased oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction resulting in impaired follicle development can ubiquinol and ubiquinol is the final active form of coq10 or ubiquinone and that is what you should be giving when you search for a supplement rather than giving just coq10 or ubiquinone and can this actually turn back the biological clock and a study i came across which thanks to nearika i've been doing intense research because i didn't want to give my same old poor responder lecture and more fit in with the theme for today and i found this slide and you can actually see here this is how a young mouse ovary looks full of primordial secondary and good antral follicles this is how a old ovary looks shrunken and this is how the ovary looks after 15 weeks of oq treatment this is a old ovary after 15 weeks you can see it almost looks as healthy as a young ovary so we have so much of evidence even at the animal level that coq10 restores oocyte mitochondrial function and fertility during reproductive aging so you can see here you have higher number of follicles in the old treated with the uh, coq as compared to old ovaries and also when you see number of oocytes retrieved significantly higher in the old ovaries treated with coq as compared to old ovaries without any kind of pre treatment so it is not that we just use supplements just for the sake of it and just to make a give a feel good factor to the patient who oh, have been given some medicine but there is actual evidence that all these uh, molecules work and then we had a lot of papers after that 2015 coenzyme q10 restores oocyte mitochondrial function 2018 particularly good paper because it deals with our commonest category of patients we all know old patients have problems but the real difficult category is the poseidon 3 and that is the young patients with a diminished ovarian reserve and these are the ones we are really worried about and here you can see 60 days of coq pre treatment before the ivf stimulation started significantly lower gonadotropin requirements higher number of retrieved oocytes higher fertilization rates more high quality embryos one problem i noticed with all the studies and what we all need to study now is that very few papers actually correlate with the final clinical pregnancy rate and the difficult part is that if the patient is given coq10 she's also been given dha she's also been given testosterone she's also been given growth hormone so we don't really know what really worked but keeping all those controlled 
definitely these papers show that there is a huge benefit of administrating a, a ubiquinol for about 60 days at least prior to ovarian stimulation. Again, 2019, important paper that uh, this pretreatment corrects post-ovulatory aging, cause meiotic defects, protects age lucite, suppresses aging, induce oxidative stress. And this supplementation is a very effective way to prevent post-ovulatory aging and contribute to better IVF success rates. But the paper which really takes the crown and the cake is this one from 2021, where they have put into very clear perspective the actual benefits. We know that insufficient levels of ubiquinol will cause all the mitochondrial damage and increased oxidative stress and so on. But what were the benefits they found? It improves ovarian reserve, very important ovarian response and oocyte quality and mainly restores oocyte mitochondrial parameters. This is very, very important. Increases the number of cumulus cells. The more the cumulus cells, the more healthy is the oocyte. You could also directly add CoQ10 to a culture media and reverse the age-induced defects which are seen in oocytes. You can also use it when you do IVM or in vitro maturation. And most importantly, they have found that CoQ10 partially, at least if not completely, also reverts oxidative stress damage in Poseidon 3, that is the oocytes of young poor responders that we face. <coughs> what evidence did they show? Of course, here they gave CoQ10 supplementation, 600 milligrams a day for 60 days. Uh, and they found that there was a reduction in the aneuploidy rate, especially in women about the age of 35. And they evaluated also IUI cycles. And in IUI, they found, again, a higher antral follicle count and more mature follicles with ubiquinol pretreatment. In the IVF group, they found a higher AFC, that is 8 versus 5, but the final number of mature follicles was the same. Significantly lower gonadotropin total dose was required to get the same response in these patients. Pregnancy rates were, however, a similar number of retrieved oocytes, zygotes, and blastocysts. And as I told you earlier, the main limitation of all these studies is that you do not have a good negative control group because as you can see here, both groups also received DHEA because of their history of a poor ovarian reserve and therefore a little bit of problem in interpretation of the results. So what they found again, that it may improve the ovarian response in aged patients and it also enhances oocyte and embryological parameters in young poor responders, may benefit women with poor ovarian response, poor response to stimulation, advanced age and PCOS. And of course, promising results have been found mostly in follicular terms and enhancement at the oocyte level was achieved in the Poseidon group three. So of course, we know that oxidative stress leads to higher apoptotic processes and CoQ10 helps to counter all these bad effects. And here you can see direct addition to culture media. Of course, we know a lot of other molecules have been tried and tested in the past. But again, they have shown that even direct addition to the culture media and even when you do in vitro maturation of oocytes, you have higher maturation rates after the addition of CoQ10. So these are the three routes of administration. Either you give in vivo to the patient in, as an oral supplement or you add to the culture medium uh, for regular IVF or you add to the culture medium for in vitro maturation of oocytes. So concluding for ubiquinol, we know it is safe, well tolerated, definitely improves mitochondrial function and creates a more favorable environment for competent follicle development. Of course, we know that no improvement has been reported regarding final pregnancy outcomes. All the outcomes they study are usually number of oocytes, number of follicles and so on. And we need more studies for that. Let's move away from the aged oocyte to the actual oxidative stress and antioxidants. And you can see here that which are the patients where you will have high levels of oxidative stress, especially endometriosis, those with hydrosalpinges, PCOs, and some patients with unexplained infertility. And we know this oxidative stress will affect various aspects of the sperm and oocyte function and ability to give you a good embryo. And every stage from the uh, oocyte right up to the blastocyst will be affected with this oxidative stress. We have been flooded with a whole number of uh, molecules for this and folate and minerals, cysteine, vitamin B6, D, E, selenium, and so on. I'm sure you all have, uh, we have the pharma companies bringing in new products every day with different combinations. So again, what is the evidence? We know that vitamin E helps to improve epithelial growth in blood vessels. Vitamin D is important. Myoinositol also helps by decreasing hyperandrogenism. L-arginine improves blood flows. N-acetylcysteine 
uh, of course, influences prostaglandin synthesis and multivitamins, of course, can also help. But again, when you look at the Cochrane meta-analysis, they compared a lot of these oral antioxidants, 63 trials, more than 7,000 women. Of course, it said there was very low quality of the evidence, uncertain whether you actually have an improvement in live birth rate, but they did also report an odds ratio of 1.8. Now, what does this mean that although it may not have reached a statistically significant difference in live birth rate, among subfertile women with an expected live birth rate of 19%, when you use antioxidants, you could expect this to increase to 24 and 36%. And I'm sure all of you agree that even a 2% increase in live birth rate is well worth trying something when you're doing an IVF. They also showed strong association between the use of antioxidants and increased live birth in PCOS women. And although they did not find a difference in regular IVF patients, and when they actually considered individual antioxidants, they found that these, especially melatonin, combined antioxidants, CoQ10 and L-carnitine showed a definite association between the use of the antioxidant and an increased clinical pregnancy rate. Another very important paper here, which studied just 10 adjuvant treatments, testosterone, DHEA, letrozole, and so on. And very important slide, they showed DHEA and CoQ10 significantly higher clinical pregnancy rates. HCG, estradiol, and growth hormone, highest number of oocytes. Testosterone and growth hormone, highest number of embryos. Growth hormone, highest estradiol levels. Clomiphen, letrozole, and uh, growth hormone used the lowest doses of gonadotropins. CoQ10 led to the lowest global cancellation rate, which again shows how you need to uh, really select what you want for a given patient. And this is what I told you earlier, that you need to prescribe something which contains the final reduced form that is ubiquinol to be really effective. We know that, of course, it's a potent antioxidant and along with folic acid would do wonders. We also have available synergistic combinations of ubiquinol with resveratrol, which personally is one of my favorites because it's a naturally occurring antioxidant. It's extracted from uh, grape skin and red wine, we all know, is anti-aging. And of course, we don't want to drink red wine every day, so we can take resveratrol to give us the same anti-aging effects. And you can see here, amongst all the naturally occurring antioxidants, resveratrol is quite high up on the list. Other useful antioxidants we have, of course, L-leucine, glutathione, all of which help to reduce oxidative stress. We have shatavari and ashwagandha, which also, more importantly, help to regularize various hormone imbalances without giving the side effects of DHEA, which we otherwise would encounter. What about inositol? We all know that inositol is good for PCO patients, but what about poor responders? And here we have a study in normal IVF patients, you have better oocyte and embryo quality and higher clinical pregnancy rates, lower abortion rates when you give myo-inositol. Mind you, this is not PCOS. This is poor responders and normal responders where you see the benefits of myo-inositol pretreatment. Proportion of grade one embryos significantly higher lower proportion of GV oocytes, and you can see significantly lower consumption of gonadotropin with myo-inositol pretreatment. The future, of course, before I end, is really promising. We have ovarian activation, autologous activated PRP injection into the ovaries. I'm sure all of you are, some of you are already doing this. And this helps because this was the initial study of four patients where they found a significant increase and they could retrieve at least five M2 oocytes despite patients with almost, who were almost menopausal for a year. And of course, they asked for more trials as always. And then we have this paper from 2019, where the PMP group had much higher clinical pregnancy rates than the control group. Prevention, of course, is better than cure. And all of us actively do social egg freezing. Fertility preservation is here to stay. It is the future. Five years ago, I used to do maybe one egg freezing a month. Today, it is almost five to 10 egg freezings every month. So there's so much of awareness now and more and more are coming forward for this. So current recommendations, can you please mute someone? So currently, what I personally recommend is, of course, pre-treatment with a combination of uh, ubiquinol with resveratrol, 40 milligrams. Then we also like to use ARG9, L-leucine, glutathione, shatavari, ashwagandha combinations, and of course, folic acid for one or two months. Then we give testosterone for 20 days pre-stimulation. You have a choice. Of course, I have given this lecture throughout the pandemic, I think almost 20 or 30 times to different groups about protocols. So I intentionally did not venture there today. The long agonist protocol with HMG or the antagonist pretreatment with the short protocol, dual stimulation, if you really like or learn how to do it. 
and fresh or frozen transfer after embryo accumulation. The main point for today is that please do not just swallow all this and start prescribing things left, right, center. We have to use at least the evidence that I showed you for the molecules which are important and proven benefit like ubiquinol, resveratrol, these have to be used. But for all the others, we still need a lot of trials and that's my 20 minute uh, timer. We need new trials, of course, to actually compare and see if the supplement improved the live birth rate rather than just giving us more follicles and more oocytes or better sperms. So with that, once again, thank you, Nearika. Thank you, uh, Rohan. Thank you, all the faculty, all the chairpersons and everyone for giving me this opportunity. And of course, Ambrosia for putting together this wonderful meeting today. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. That was an excellent deliberation and it's such a treat to hear you speak. And I would like to request Aruna, ma'am, uh, to kindly give your concluding remarks, ma'am. Aruna Suman, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. I congratulate Young Talent Promotion Committee Chairperson, Dr. Niharika Malhotra and her team for thinking and organizing this conference, which is very rare and not frequently covered. The role of nutraceuticals and nutrients in infertility. Thank you, sir. That's a really excellent talk. You have covered everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aruna, ma'am. May, may I now request uh, Dr. Girija Wag, ma'am, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. N. Sanjeeva Reddy, sir. Ma'am. Girija, ma'am. If Girija, ma'am, is not there. Uh, Archana, ma'am, is there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah ma'am, can you please introduce our next speaker? Please Dr. share the screen, Ravi. Dr. N. Sanjeeva Reddy, sir. Ravi, can we please have Dr. Sanjeeva Reddy, sir, CV, please? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. I take this opportunity to introduce another great speaker, Dr. N. Sanjeeva Reddy. He is Professor, Department of Reproductive Medicine and Surgery, Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, Chennai. He started the first super speciality course, MCH in Reproductive Medicine. He has several awards to his credit and to mention Dr. B.C. Roy National Award for Eminent Medical Teacher in 2015. He has been a panel expert panel member to Medical Council of India, a specialist board member in reproductive medicine, and he's a founder secretary of TAPI SAR, past president of OGSSI, and organizing secretary AICOG 2015 Chennai, and um, organizing secretary ISAR 2015 Chennai. And um, over to you, Dr. Sanjeeva Reddy, for your deliberation. Uh, Sanjeeva Reddy, sir, can we request you to, yeah, yes, sir, sure. Sir, you are on mute mode, sir. Yeah, sir, can we please request you to sir, unmute yourself and switch on your camera also, please, sir. Thank you, sir. So we still can't hear you, sir. Okay. okay. At the outset, I would like to thank Poxy and the Young Talent Promotion Committee Chairperson, Dr. Niharka and coordinators, Dr. Rohan and Inkur and other uh, stalwarts of Young Promotion Committee. Thank you. Today, I'm going to speak on just this.
just two minutes please there are some problems I'm going to speak on what to do in an unexplained infertility. Do nutrient supplements help? Unexplained infertility refers to the absence of a definable cause for a couple's failure to achieve pregnancy after 12 months of attempting conception despite a thorough evolution or after six months in women 35 years and older. See, what is thorough evaluation? Patient should be ovulating normally and the both tubes should be tent and the seminal parameter should be normal. This is a must. Other things are optional. What are the causes for infertility take? As we will know, like uh, in this, both male and combined factors are important. Around 15% is due to unexplained. What could be the possible etiologies in this? There may be subtle changes in the follicular development, ovulation, and luteal phase defect. In other couples, it may, there may be sperm parameters at the lower end of the normal range. There may be implantation failure, subtle cervical factors, problem with sperm and egg transport, or interaction, or other possibilities. There are many causes of unexplained infertility are probably caused by the presence of multiple factors like female partner over 35 years of age with a diminished ovarian reserve and male partner with low normal semen parameters. The oocyte fertilization and the embryo cleavage rate, if you compare between unexplained infertility and pupil factor, the pupil, pupil factor, the fertilization, everything is better when compared with the uh, unexplained infertility. Same way, there is higher rate of complete fertilization failure seen in unexplained infertility. This suggests that couples with unexplained infertility probably have certain functional abnormalities in oocyte and or sperm function. Defective endometrial receptor is also is important, may account for some cases of unexplained infertility. There is no biomarkers have been validated for clinical diagnosis of these patients. The balance, if you come to the management, there is we have to balance the efficacy, cost, safety, and risks of various treatment alternatives. A common approach is to start with the treatment that consume few resources and are patient-directed, like lifestyle changes and time intercourse, then move sequentially to treatments requiring proportionately greater resources, like lumpen citrate plus IUI. Finally, to have high resource interventions like IVF. So what are the options available for us? There may be expectant management, IUA alone, ovarian stimulation with oral lasers alone, ovarian stimulation with gonadotropin alone, ovarian stimulation with oral lasers plus IUA, ovarian stimulation with gonadotropin and IUA, gonadotropin plus IUA, what's the clomphene citrate plus IUA, gonadotropin plus IUA, what's the letrozole IUA, and finally, we have IVF or ICC. When it comes to the expectant management, there is in good prognosis couples, that is the age of the patient is less than 33 years and the mar marital life is less than two years. There was 27% live birth without intervention at six months, a study done by STRS. So the recommendation is, in couples with a good prognosis, expectant management can be offered if there is no other problem for this patient. Then um, the evidence-based treatments for couples with unexplained infertility, a practice committee guideline by the ASRM released in 2020, whether intrauterine insemination and natural cycle, here the recommendation is it is not recommended to perform IUA in nature cycle for the treatment of unexplained infertility as it is less effective than ovarian stimulation with IUA and likely no more effective than expected management. There is strong evidence and also strength of evidence also is strong. Plus, clomphene citrate with timely intercourse. Clomphene citrate here 
whether it can be allowed in this patient. The recommendation is it is not recommended to clomiphene citrate with intercourse as a uh, treatment for unexplained infertility. It is no more effective than management, like uh, expectant management. Next is aromatase with uh, intercourse. The recommendation says it is not recommended to use letrozole with primary intercourse as a treatment for unexplained infertility. It is also no, not more effective than expectant management. Then gonotropins and intercourse, whether it is advisable. The recommendation is this is also, it is not recommended to use gonotropin with the time intercourse in the treatment of unexplained infertility. Studies report either no difference in pregnancy outcomes compared to ovarian stimulation with oral agents or higher pregnancy rates associated with, but there will be higher multiple pregnancy rate will be there. That's why it's not advisable. Next is ovarian stimulation with IEI. Here it is recommended to use clomiphene citrate with IA in the treatment of couples with unexplained infertility. The strength of evidence is strong. Next is where stimulation has uh, and uh, aromatase inhibitors. What about aromatase inhibitors? Here it is recommended that letrozole with IA treatments uh, may be considered as an alternative regime for couples with unexplained infertility as studied to date such a similar efficacy like uh, clomiphene citrate, but in a, the FDA is not approved letrozole, but other places, wherever they are using, the pregnancy rate is almost equal to letrozole or sometimes better in PCOS patient. Next is let gonotropins, along with whether oral ovulations, whether we can give the gonotropins, is there any, uh, you know, better treatment is there. It is not recommended to use letrozole or clomiphene state plus conventional dose gonotropins with IA. Most studies associated with improved pregnancy rate over ovulation stimulation plus IA with oral medications are also associated with multiple pregnancy, increased multiple pregnancy. That's why it is not advisable to add gonotropins to the oral ovulations plus IA. Next is Gonotropins, low dose gonotropins, will it help? IUA with low dose gonotropins, that is less than 150 IU, has been searched as an alternate to IUA with conventional dose gonotropins. The recommendation is it is not recommended to use low dose gonotropins with IUA in the treatment of unexplained infertility. It is more complex and expensive and likely no more effective than ovarian stimulation with oral medications with IUA. Next is conventional dose gonotropin. Here the recommendation, is it is not recommended to use conventional dose gonotropin with IUA. Most studies associated with improved pregnancy rate or ovulation stimulation plus with IUA with oral medications as the multiple pregnancy rate is very high if you use gonotropins plus IUA alone. Next is whether there is any timing of IUA from the time of trigger, will it help? The recommendation is it is recommended that a single IA be performed between 0 to 36 hours related to HC injection in ovulation stimulation with the IA treatment. There is no difference whatever time you do the IUA. Next, about what about the IVF? The recommendation it is recommended that couples with unexplained infertility initially undergo a course of uh, typically three to four cycles of ovulation stimulation and IA with oral agents. If it is not successful, then you can go for the IVF. Next is, is there a role? Is there, what is the role of neutraceuticals in unexplained infertility? My previous doings already they discuss the what is neutraceuticals, what are the types, what is the mechanisms, and Dr. Jatin is discussed each one separately. So I'm going to tell only three or four papers uh, because there is no particular literature pertaining to only uh, unexplained infertility. Neutraceuticals are foods or food ingredients that provides medical or health benefits 
including the prevention and the treatment of a disease. It is an inclusive term that describes products derived from food that can provide extra health benefits beyond the basic nutritional value found in foods. Used in its purest form, nutraceuticals bridge the world between food and pharmaceuticals. The term nutraceutical is therefore used as an all-encompassing term, including plant-based foods and byproducts, supplements, minerals, and vitamins. There is a, a Cochrane review. The antioxidants for male infertility. The author's conclusion is there is low quality evidence from only four small randomized controlled trials suggesting that the antioxidant supplementation in subfertile males may improve live birth rates for couples attending fertility clinics. There is a low quality evidence suggests that clinical pregnancy rates may increase. There is no evidence of increased risk of miscarriage, but this is uncertain as the evidence is very low quality. Data were lacking on other adverse effects. Further, large, well-designed randomized placebo control trials are needed to clarify these results. With another study, the role of nutraceuticals in male infertility. Here, the conclusion is infertility couples are likely to try multiple nutraceuticals, hoping to improve their chance of conception. The current English literature is full of studies exposing the positive effect of nutraceuticals on semen parameters and pregnancy rates. Conclusions regarding their effects on male separability could not be identified. However, a recent Cochrane review did demonstrate improved pregnancy and live birth rates. In another review, the management of male infertility from nutraceuticals to diagnostics. The conclusion of the, the recent innovations to help a patient of infertility, nutritional strategies have been endorsed with a beneficial impact on sperm count, motility, and fertility. The modern medicine is continuously evolving and should stay abreast of this pioneering concept of food and health benefits. At this regard, patients should be nutritionally educated and oriented to, to treat male infertility at the root of the problem. Next paper, nutraceuticals. Uh, here, the conclusion of this paper is, the results is done in uh, Italy. The results of this large retrospective study show that the use of the male fertility nutraceutical Manivit is associated with superior live birth rates during IVF treatment, primarily in lean men, while acknowledging that a large artists are still required to absolutely prove therapeutic benefit, the positive association with manuit anti-extent use and live birth outcomes combined with low cost. This contains uh, lycopene, vitamin E, vitamin C, zinc, selenium, folic acid, and garlic oil. Next, the Infertility sterility, female dietary anti-accident intake, and time to pregnancy they have studied. Here, the objective is to determine whether increased anti-accident intake in women is associated with a shorter time to pregnancy. The conclusion of the study is shorter time to pregnancy was observed among women with BMI less than 25 kg per square meter with increasing vitamin C. And women with BMA more than 25 kg with increase in beta keratin. And when it, they took the age, women less than 35 years with increase in beta keratin and vitamin C they supplemented. And women more than 35 years with increase in vitamin E, they got benefited. Next is the latest in 2021 dietary supplements for female infertility, a critical review. Here, what they have done, they have taken all types of anti uh, antioxidant supplements, combinations, what they are doing. They have studied whether each combination is working or not. And also they compared the doses. These are the doses, minimal doses they have found out. Suppose we take the melatonin, which is three milligrams, folic acid, 400 micrograms, myoinstal four grams per day, and decuroinstal 300 milligrams per day and NAC is 1.2 grams and uh, UBQ 
600 milligrams, carnitine one gram, and vitamin D is 80 micrograms. The conclusion of the study, the majority of dietary supplements for female infertility had at least one or more ingredients with no proven effect. In addition, ingredients with proven efficacy were frequently underdosed and are combined with a variety of nutrients with unknown effects on female fertility. These findings raise serious doubts about the potential effectiveness of most commercially uh, supplied dietary supplements for female infertility. Our approach could be applied in the evolution of dietary supplements marketed in other fields and in other countries. So a patient comes to us with unexplained infertility. We have to see well, whether we can, if there is a low risk, we can try the expected management like lifestyle and interventions, that thing. Suppose there is a start with low resource interventions like conopinacetate, letrozole plus IEA. If it is high risk, after that, you can go for the high resource interventions or there is some indication that you directly can go to the high resource interventions like gonadotropin plus IEA. If everything is fails, then finally we are going for the IVF ICSI. Now, in addition, we can try this new testicles also, it's not going to create any problem to the patient. Finally, if nothing is succeeding, then we have to go for the donor program. So finally, for most couples with unexplained infertility, the best initial therapy is a course of um, three or four cycles of ovulation induction with uh, oral ovulogens plus IUI, followed by IVF if it is not working. There is a pressing need for additional therapies to bridge the wide gap in effectiveness between ovulation stimulation IEA with oral medications and IVF. Further research is needed into methods to improve access to care, including ART treatments. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for that wonderful talk. Uh, uh, we always love listening to your talks, and it was another such uh, another such talk that we thoroughly enjoyed and learned from, sir. I would like to congratulate you also for winning the Health World National Fertility Award from the South Zone, sir, which you have received today. So congratulations for that. And I would now like to invite our chairperson, Dr. Amaya Purandere, sir, to kindly conclude this talk. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sanjeeva Reddy, sir, for that excellent talk. It really gave us the insights about how we can use these important products for the benefit of our patients. So there is a lot of science involved and science finally uh, should be coupled with safety in order to obtain success. So thank you so much. On behalf of the other chairpersons, I would again like to thank the organizers of today for giving us the honor to uh, be chairing a session uh, where such eminent stalwarts in the field of fertility from all over the country uh, have given us such valuable insights and disseminated knowledge. Thank you so much. Over to you, Priyanka. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your And I see that uh, Girija ma'am is also with us. So can I just uh, ask Girija ma'am and Archana ma'am to conclude the entire session before we move on to the next session? Please. Absolutely. Thank you, Priyankur. And before the um, I say anything about the session, I want to congratulate the young team under the leadership of Dr. Neharika for bringing out such an important topic of concern. And as I always would like to see, before I am a fertility specialist, I also am an high risk obstetrician. And I feel, especially women who undergo assisted reproduction or who have challenges, have many times these issues of nutrition. And therefore, we must use that window of opportunity three to six months prior while you're embarking on their fertility optimization. You can consider this important aspect of existence where you can bring about a lot of reduction in the oxidative stress and try to improvise not only on fertility outcomes, but even perinatal outcomes subsequently in that particular pregnancy. And thank you so much for having such wonderful stalwarts talking about this very, very vital and core topic. Thank you, Priyankur, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Can I request Archana, ma'am, for the final comments before we move on to the next session, please? 
thank you priyanku for the opportunity and uh, at the again i would like to congratulate the young team of young talent promotion committee for bringing out such a wonderful uh, subject a very very focused topic and all the speakers were par excellence i mean we even uh, myself i have learned few very important points that apart from the psychological stress even the nutritional stress has to be really taken care of so i mean it was a wonderful uh, listening to all of them so thank you very much for a such a good talks and uh, congratulations once again so i think let's move ahead thank you thank you so much ma'am so i would like to thank our uh, chairpersons dr achana basir ma'am dr girija wag ma'am dr amay purandare sir and dr aruna suman ma'am for chairing the session so wonderfully and of course uh, kudos to our brilliant speakers nandita pal chetkar ma'am jatin shah sir and dr sanjeeva reddy sir for the brilliant talk i now hand over this session to dr yeah, shela can we Dumar. have one question and sir one one Thank question uh, jatin sir has answered all the questions on the q and a chat Yes. Fine. So done. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. So now I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Shaila Jamal, Dr. Rohan Palchetkar, and Dr. Anshu Basse to kindly take us through to the next important session too. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Anshu, you're audible. Please go on. Thank you. Hi. Hey, um. So uh, after that wonderful session, uh, we move on to the next session uh, uh, that we have. Uh, it is my proud privilege to introduce the chairperson for the next session. Uh, can I have the sleeve of Dr. Kavita, please? Hello. Yeah. So our first chairperson for the day is Dr. Kavita Bapit. She is again a very well-known figure, and uh, she is an obstetrician and gynecologist. Currently practicing in at Bapit Hospital in Dhar. She is a vice president Foxy, and uh, again, a specialist in one day hysterectomy. A very big name in in Dhar here. So it is a privilege to welcome Madam today. uh the i think madam is a bit busy at the moment she said she'll try to join uh the next chair person we have for today can i have dr sashi versus uh, cv please hello uh, ravi please change the slide so next Uh, again we are very honored to have dr fessy lewis with us he is a senior consultant and associate professor and in charge of the mcs course he is currently at the department of reproductive medicine and surgery at amrita institute of medical sciences in kerala he is a foxy vice president isar national executive mem mem member icog governing council member vice chairperson kerala chapter of ig and he has received many awards he is uh, all, the all india foxy international academic exchange committee chairperson he is the editor of tfog journal and website and he has received the foxy korean kamini rao you are orator award amazing science award so uh, welcome sir and uh, we are delighted to have you with us as a chairperson uh, i think uh, I uh, I think Dr. Uh, now hand over to Dr. Shahila uh, who to introduce the other two chair persons. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anshu, and uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Pavanthi sir as uh, the next chair person. Sir is senior consultant OBGY and an infertility specialist. He is running his own advanced infertility endoscopy IVF center. and uh, last conversation that i had with sir was one hour back he was busy in staging uh, the laparoscopy so sir said he may not be able to join but anyways we know and he has sent his best wishes across especially to dr neharika for taking over this initiative uh, can we have the next slide please uh we have uh, uh, dr girish mane sir chairperson adolescent health committee currently he is past president of yavatmal obgy society past chairperson adolescent gynecology committee of amogs 
awarded best chairperson amox in 2018-20 recipient of foxy smriti mylan save baby runner up award recipient of best society award amox recipient of the dr durusha youth trophy and dr sadhna desai award in 2017 first winner of foxy talent singing contest and yes and here we are excited to have you sir uh, we always love to hear your voice and now uh, we are looking forward for your expert uh, 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 these comments for the upcoming session on infertility so we hand over the dais to uh, esteemed chairpersons for the session too good evening to all i think after hearing from that uh, excellent three uh, talks we'll be going to the second session where we'll be hearing much more interesting and uh, really innovative talks and for, for the first talk uh, especially it is a real challenge for all the infertility especially how you manage the thin endometrium for that uh, for newer advances of thin endometrium we have uh, uh, Dr. Sundar Thunderwood, Madam is there. Can you show Madam's uh, CV? I think actually Madam doesn't mm -hmm. need an introduction, but as a format, you have to introduce her. <coughs> Madam is the, uh, can you make the slide show more? Madam is the head of department. And, uh, and chief of IVF and endoscopy center Ruby Hall Clinic Pune, and advisor and consultant of DY Patel IVF and endoscopy center Pune, founder and medical director of Solo Clinic IVF Pune, and founder and medical director of Solo Stem Cells Stem Cell Research Application Center. And, and Madam's extraordinary achievement is in the India's first stem cell baby in Wales, first at the age of 45 in 2018. Right now, Madam is the president of Pune Obstetrics and Gynecology Society, chairperson, founder, honorary secretary of ISA, Maharashtra State Chapter, second vice president of ISA, National ISA, president IAG 19 to 20, vice president West Zone of Foxy. Casey, we are getting late. Can we start? Oh, oh, I, th I think one more sentence. Madam has authored a lot of books and published a lot of uh, articles. So it, it will be very much informative and and uh, first and information to hear from uh, somebody who has dealt with thin endometrium and that's what we are all looking for over to you madam thank you thank you first of all uh, because we are really running late i don't want it to send but thank you so much for having me neharika uh, lovely team, dear, and the Ambrosia, Mr. Dramesh, you are an amazing person. Congratulations. The YTP committee is really, uh, you know, uh, it has made the foxy vibrant. With these young people around, everyone feels young. Everyone feels rejuvenated, like taken an IV stem cells, and every organ has become this. So, Neharika, you are asset to whichever... Uh, organization you will work and I can imagine and I really feel jealous of Narendra and Jaydeep who have 24 by 7 you at their uh, hand. So love you darling and let's start about thin endometrium solving the mystery what are the recent things what are the evidences we talk about but before i go for this the key question is does monitoring of endometrial thickness affect the efficacy and safety evidence actually there are no studies if you see really monitoring the thickness with no monitoring the thickness there are no studies because everyone monitors the thing and that's why we don't know we we'll, alternatively we always look at the study which investigate whether the endometrial thickness is predictive for implantation and live birth so uh, whether by achieving a good thickness, am I going to promise if I have a good embryo, the implantation and the carry on baby? Now, when uh, all my friends who had given a talk, who are in this for more than two decades, before the era of vitrification, when we used to do the uh, uh, embryo freezing by slow freezing method, fresh transfer, we always used to do it. And during the fresh transfer, we 
we used to give little or no much attention of course thin endometrium we were bothered 3 mm 4 mm but 6 mm 7 mm 8 mm at the time of trigger still we used to go routinely for a fresh embryo transfers and if you see the meta analysis with 10000 patients included little or no discrepancy capacity for a clinical pregnancy rate and in addition the study by grisenberg reported that the independent contribution of endometrial thickness to live birth is very small and is undetermined and that's why evidence am never proven as long as fresh transfer is concerned every great advancement was once again nothing more than a dream in the mind of a visionary and someone visionary came with the vitrification and the frozen embryo transfer has ruled this in industry though endometrium is one of the most important factor uh, in uh, involved in achieving the optimal outcomes owing to its passive growth following the adequate stimulation it has no uh, virtually received no attention till one and half decades ago only when either the endometrial thickness or ultrasonographic pattern is in inadequate we started working on how to optimize so how do you define the thin endometrium if i ask everyone endometrial thickness that cannot reach the threshold of implantation this is the definition said by toffy toki in 2008 so there is no clear cut what is the ideal cut off of the endometrial thickness when should i say it is a thin and when i should say it is adequate there is no agreement to it most clinicians though use a cut off value of 7 mm the pregnancy we all know that have been reported at 5 mm also at 15 mm if you see more carefully the uh, publications holden et al have published a study of 3.7 mm getting implantation and by coelho group at 5.6 mm and both this pregnancy they had a live birth rate not that they landed in missed abortion or oligo or small size baby endometrial thickness and pregnancy rate after the art a systemic meta analysis yes there is a significantly lower implantation rate when it is less than 7 mm and positive and negative predictive value for the outcome of clinical pregnancies 77 and 48% respectively so it's quite low as such but clinical pregnancy rate if you see all these meta analysis less than 7 mm they say definitely clinical pregnancy rate is less but there this lack of consensus can be explained only because there is no exact definition of thin endometrium and etiology of a thin endometrium may play significant part in the endometrial uh, receptivity and hence the implantation so sometimes if it is a pathological thin endometrium because of uh, maybe infections in the cavity or because of the intrauterine adhesions then that prob probably is a pathological thin endometrium which may not give but if you have a very good dry laminar even 5.5 mm with excellent vascularity and there is no pathology in uh, cavity you may get still the implantation so etiology of a thin endometrium may play a very important role and that's why this study is concluded that less than 7 mm yes there is a uh, probably we land up in cycle cancellation freezing all uh, embryos and maybe advising the surrogacy our own dr nalini majan has written a beautiful review article the endometrium how thin is thin and they these are very important points i think they have mentioned into there though endometrial thickness is not predictive of pregnancy the probability of pregnancy is reduced after 6 mm and the reason for low implantation could be because there is a high impedance flow now why this is important because it's not only the thickness but the vascularity also is count and that's why i thought of uh, presenting this study to you all in addition to the lower implantation the process of invasion also may get hindered due to the lack of adequate endometrial bed and invasion which is a third step of implantation may be at a difficulty when the endometrial thickness is low we do we just say thin endometrium 
or shall we talk about the pattern also yes it's very important that if it is a triple line appearance we call it as a grade a or receptive and grade c when it is a homogeneous appearance and grade b homogeneous but the uh, junctional zone is still well defined and the central line is well defined but friends sometimes you should know that when it is a hyperechoic it may be because of excessive dose of estrogen which has gone so again there is endometrial pattern sometimes hyper per echoic pattern uh, though they say there uh, there can be a failure but pregnancy have been described what is important is you know sometimes when you put a gcsf also you get lot of hyper echoic pattern so it's very important how you are counting and how you are doing if you see the prevalence it is from 2.4 to 11% of the cases it means maybe one in 10 cases you may land up and the usual way we do is just by the sonography sonography has helped us tremendously in not only measuring the thickness the trilaminar pattern the color doppler pattern whether the color doppler flow is reaching to the endometrium and also helps whether we should be taking this as a predictive or not very predictive sometimes instead of thin endometrium is it we should be talking about the endometrial volume even if it is a unicornate uterus but if you have done a unilateral metroplasty redesigning of the cavity do you think you have increased the volume and then it is uh, enough for you to achieve the pregnancy all these are very important and controversial points and we need to understand molecular uh, the, uh, studies only by the era which i am not going to do it so how do you prepare the lining and how do you and when do you start the treatment so the topic given to me is where what modalities we should give and it was very important for me to explain to you when should we start these modalities also so how do we routinely prepare we all need we all know that estrogen very important component beyond the question it helps not only in endometrial proliferation but spiral artery contraction and reducing the oxygen tension in the functional layer and it also helps in embryo implantation now these things are so important and they keep on happening without our knowledge because we just prescribe the and uh, estrogens to the patient there is no relevant difference between micronized estradiol or estradiol valrate though the main route of admission uh, is oral there are some other routes also maybe more people are moving on to the transdermal because it's a easy for the patient then keep on popping so many tablet especially those who are having a acid peptic diseases and there are usually we start with a6 to 8 mg and then we do the progressive step up which will simulate as a natural cycle which happens to in general we all have to know that 2 mg of Uh, estrogen is enough to stop the hpo axis and that's why we make the patient an ovulatory and that's the reason your exogenous estrogen is the only part if you are not doing a natural cycle monitoring it is the estrogen which plays a very important now how long should i wait for the uh, estrogen alone without adding any uh, adjuvants in general human endometrium is capable of maintaining its receptivity even in the prolonged follicular phase this is very important everyone thinks shall i wait for 14 days shall i go for 20 days shall i go for 28 days can i wait for 35 days yes you can the receptivity doesn't matter uh, decreases with the increasing follicular phase so there are studies we have which have waited even to 85 days the mean endometrial thickness has increased significantly from 6.5 mm to uh, 8.6 mm after an extended estrogen therapy 
So sometimes if the lining is reaching 6 mm and you are waited for seven days and it is still 6 mm, then you will think about either stepping up or adding on some adjuvants. But you give a natural uh, weight also at least in a very first cycle. So again, few studies have shown high doses up to nine weeks they can do. Now the question is, if you did not get the optimal thickness, even after your conventional therapy of estrogens, maybe for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, then what shall I do? And either shall I cancel the cycle? Shall I change the brand of estradiol or use of our adjuvants? And then the role of all these adjuvants or the management comes. The four things which we think about is hormonal manipulations, increasing their doses, whether we should improve the endometrial perfusion, whether we should do the hysteroscopy by canceling the cycle, or we think of adding the new modality, cancel the cycle, start the new modalities and do this. Hormonal manipulations, I have spoken. You keep on increasing those. Now let's talk about how do I improve the vascularity? Because if I improve the vascularity, I can have a better deposition of the estrogen or even with the 6 mm, but the great three zone vascularity present, I may get implantation. So where do the estrogen uh, aspirin start? Yes, they say that aspirin can help, but about the sildenafil, solid data is lagging. About the L-arginine, we all know it is a vasodilator, but there is no solid data to support it. GCSF, there are two school of thoughts. We all know that GCSF is a glycoprotein, which can help us in, to improve the vascular endometri uh, uh, endothelium and improve the immunocytes and other things. It also helps in stromal cell decidualization. And there are many publications about the stem cells. If you keep on going into the various uh, publications, you will find that there are group who supports it, who uses it rapidly, but there is no data which will 100% say, and the Cochrane has not proven it. SCG injections in the proliferative phase. Intrauterine SCG injection, because of its uh, vascular VGF factor, which it releases, colony stimulating factors it releases. People have tried injecting the SCG into intrauterine. Again, there are controversy. And let's talk about the platelet-rich plasma. Now, platelet-rich plasma, we all know that it activates and releases the cytokines, growth factors, VGF, and transform the growth factors and platelet-derived growth factors, which will help in implantation. Can it benefit the very first publication by Chang Group in 2015? They have taken a five patients and they, which were inclusion criteria where they extended estrogen regime or the other modalities have failed to give more than seven mm and they have done with the PRP and they all five patients achieved the endometrial thickness of more than five mm and that is where the all people started working on it. So we did way back in 2017, our publication came after reading Chang's article. And fortunately, during the same period, I entered into the stem cells in 2015. We decided why not to study ourselves. And Jan 2016 to August 2016, in six months, we took a 60 eight patients in our study group and the transfer was happened in 64. The four cycles we canceled because we did not got the results at all in that. And indications for those PRPs were these patients with the thin endometrium. And what we found was the endometrial thickness pre-PRP uh, um, and the post-PRP, there was a significant increase, but we also found that it is not only the increase in the thickness, but increase in the vascularity also. It is so beautiful. It is so beautiful to study the same woman uh, when uh, you have done the PRP and you find the power Doppler showing a beautiful lining, but it has not yet to reach to the central zone, you may wait. So important thing is it is not only increases the thickness, but the vascularity, or I will say vascularity and hence the thickness. 
And during that time, we found in around 59 to 60%, we got a pregnancy in the thin endometrium patients. So uh, another important thing about our study was, uh, we studied up to the second trimester. So all the first trimester cases where we landed in missed abortion and all were also included in our studies. And uh, I think that was at that time, the largest study. And in last four years, there are so many studies because I myself have 57 citations about my study. It means there are n number of people now routinely using platelet-rich plasma. Friends, I cannot explain you how we do preparation, but remember that you need to activate this PRP before you inject into your trine cavity. So would like to remind all that it's not only the thickness, pattern, volume, or the vascularity, but also it's very important. Just don't think about the thickness and vascularity and how is the endometrial pattern. One has to develop the pregnancy prediction model based on the sonographic picture. We just can't have a trial aminar 8 mm and we got into. So this is very important validated normogram prediction model, which is important because its sensitivity and specificities, if you see it is 0.96. So it's very important. So we need such predictive model. And what we do at Solo Clinic is this predictive model. So when it gives me a score of 14, it means the chance of Conception by my score is 60%. So we need to have such predictive model, which will tell us these models will help us to predict whether I can go ahead. So usually when it is below 13, I don't consider I cancel the cycle. Also, sometimes endometrial thickness is good, 7.2 mm. But if I don't have a vascularity, my vascularity is zero, I will cancel even if my score is 60% predictive value because I have always seen Sometimes you can afford to have 6 mm, but if there is a sparse vascularity, I have not got in last 22 years a single case with the pregnancy. So if there is no vascularity, please cancel irrespective. So this is the predictive model, model which we in, uh, use routinely in our clinic. So endometrial and uh, endo embryo crosstalk through a known crucial growth factors and cytokines, which are secreted from endometrial cells. All this is also equally important. Endometrial receptivity study is equally important. Hysteroscopy, I'm going to pass on because uh, the time doesn't allow me to talk more about it, but there are many surgical strategies when it is recurrent thin endometrium, not responding even to your PRP, hysteroscopy plays a very important role and you should have it. It has associated other beneficial effect. We all know that. And that is where the endometrial scratching also came. Now, last three, four minutes, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is then not an act, but a habit. This is very important. And that is the new models. So you are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. At the age of 55, and when I entered into the autologous bone marrow for some other degenerative disease, Diseases, I realized why not to think about mobilizing these endometrium. We all know that endometrial uh, is region, it has a regenerative properties. It is highly regenerative tissue, which undergoes more than 400 cycles of growth, differentiation, and shedding during the woman's reproductive years. So why not to go and take out the bone marrow stem cells, and why not to mobilize the basal endometrium? Forget about all the studies which work only on the endometrium which has developed. Forget about the all components which work only on the endometrium which got regenerated. So whether it is a estrogen or whether it is a PRP, all will work only when there is three millimeter, four millimeter, five millimeters endometrium. But if it is the endometrial thinness is because there is a damage to the vessel endometrium, maybe because of the surgical damage or maybe because of some pathology in it. What is important is you need to prepare these bone marrow stem cells and you need to regenerate these endometrial cells. 
Now, bone marrow stem cells can incorporate into the endometrium in small in amount, and it can differentiate way back from 2004. These studies were there. We all knew that the uh, stem cells have a power of regeneration, power of regeneration of any organ where you insert that stem cells too. And many publication, our own Dr. Nagori way back in 2011 has spoken about it. And then there are Carlos and Simon group who is also working on the uh, intrauterine uh, I should say on the stem cells overall. I think they also work more of autologous bone marrow derived and they have seen uh, successful pregnancies after that. So what is important is your creative mind. Can I take out these bone marrow and can I do it into the uh, uh, endometrial cavity and can I work? And I'm going to show you the video where this is now where PRP and all will not work. What is most important is regeneration. Now this patient had repeated curettage. She had a damage to her. She had uh, intrauterine adhesion, but the rest of the cavity is pink. So these are the good prognostic patients you should select on these. And then first is you need to be a good endoscopic surgeon, hysteroscopic surgeon, and first is create the cavity. Usually what I do is if I have created the cavity today, I do the bone marrow next day because I don't like to waste the bone marrow if I could not create the cavity. Now this patient was referred as a complete Asherman to me. When we entered in, we found it's beautiful. Left side, I can see even the corner. It was not a, a level of for Asherman and what is important is fiber by fiber dissection. Remember, don't be over enthusiastic. You can see the right corner, very happy. It was a uh, over curettage, which has caused these intrauterine adhesions. And what is important is even in tuberculosis, I do the same. Now, what is important is half cavity white and half cavity pink. You can see it. Next day, post this patient for the uh, mm, uh, autologous bone marrow derived stem cells. So we have put in the stem cells. I think this was a tuberculous endometritis a case, but the second look uh, hysteroscopy was performed after the four weeks of this. And you see now the same patient after the stem cell therapy, a fantabulous, I'm happy. First of all, everything is pink. Second, near 80% of the cavity is re-maintained. So I can just do the uh, adhesiolysis now. The cavity, you can see the coronal openings are still there. So the stem cell has worked fabulously. Now in this cavity, since I'm going in, I might as well do one PRP for this patient, no problem. But I will just take this patient for the preparation or a frozen embryo transfer in immediate next cycle. So this is how the autologous bone marrow derived stem cells can help in a selected woman and can help to avoid the surrogacy or today when the ART bill has passed, when the third party reproduction, whether it is a donor egg or the surrogacy has been stopped, we all have to work toward the stem cells to regenerate either ovaries or the endometrium. Friends, advances in science is always for the betterment of human being. What is important is we just don't do for the sake of doing. We have to select the cases which will give a results and then only uh, probability of the results and then only we should do so that the stem cells will not be blamed that it doesn't work. It did not work because you did not select the proper cases. So one has to understand and also we have to understand and say it very loud and clear that it is still under research. It is not taken as a therapy and there are ethical concerns. ICMR has its own guidelines. You need to have your NAC SCART in place along with your stem cells and you need to register. I know it is very difficult to work with ICMR. I always thank uh, Alka Kriplani, madam, who suggested me to go to the government of India, DCGI, and I approach them and I revamp my entire lab because I have interest and I redesigned another lab as per the criteria of DCGI and we got 
our DCGI certification for a manufacturing of the stem cells uh, from autologous bone derived cell for a female infertility. So for ovarian regeneration as well as endometrial regeneration. But what is important is after hysteroscopy, if I do the after that, next day, I do the stem cells. Never uh, I prepare the stem cell and then take the patient for hysteroscopy because you can judge a lot over the years of experience whether this cavity is worth reforming or not. Friends, uh, after climbing a great hill, one only find that there are many more hills to climb. You cannot say I have achieved everything in life every day. You climb up one, you realize there is more. After doing a obstetric, you end up in doing endoscopy. You realize you need to enter in ART to give a success. And in ART alone is not enough. You need to enter into stem cells and you keep on climbing up. Surrogacy has its own limitation. We all know it's barred now and uterine transplantation. It is a futuristic approach. One has to think over, I don't know, the time will decide whether the uterine transplant, whether it is worth or not. I think I'm overshooting the time, but this is what the clinical uh, evidence of managing the uh, thin endometrium where we stand and ultimately, friends, if I have to conclude about this, it is not easy to provide an evidence-based approach. Lack of evidence to favor any of the summarized approaches does not mean that some might not work in selected particular patients. So keep on working. It may not have worked in one patient. It may work. Hysteroscopic evaluation is very important. PRP will help you in thin endometrium or the sparse vascularity. And autologous bone marrow derived stem cell can show promising results in selected cases and maybe a future ray of hope in those who don't wish to go or now can't go for a surrogacy. Case customization is mandatory in infertility. Friends, the next step will be to understand the physiology of the type of endometrium. This is very important. The moment we understand the physiology, the moment we understand the intricacy of implantation, the cytokine atmosphere to need for the improving the receptivity, we may be in a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. That was such a wonderful, clear-cut session and so crisp to the point. We really enjoyed it. Uh, I would now like our chairperson, Dr. Fessy Lewis, and I think we, uh, and the experts, Dr. Narendra Malota, to just have a few comments before they, uh, we introduce the next speaker. And also, Dr. Girija, please. Dr. But I think, uh, uh, Sinida Madam, I think there was no doubt to uh, for the, those who are hearing that what all things can be done and what are the latest and what people are be doing and what are the difficulties uh, will be there. I just only one, if you can highlight the, the you told about the activation part. How do there are people okay. activating different? So it is a uh, two way, either physical or a chemical activation. Physical means you need to just for a 60 seconds, uh, the syringe in which you take the PRP, you just roll on, roll on. So you break those platelets. Otherwise, there is a calcium carbonate and other chemicals which you can inject safely. We used both the methods and both the methods worked equally good. So what we are doing is uh, we are also doing a lot of PRP injections for thin endometrium, but we are injecting hysteroscopically subendometrially and not leaving. See what we do is activated PRP when you collected it, roll it and activate it, and then with the ovum pickum needle go under it under the endometrium in five six places, insert a foley's before that and foley's. The hysteroscope goes by the side of the foley's and injects, then the bulb is inflated and rest of the PRP half ml of what is left in the cavity. Otherwise, if you just leave PRP in the cavity, it's all going to come out within a few minutes only. No, so it doesn't, no, and that is, that I, is I what we like have to, to I would like to defer here 
uh, the stem cell is the one which we do uh, subendometrial under hysteroscopic control. Now, what Narendra is talking about uh, doing a hysteroscopy and doing the PRP subendometrial, it, in that you cannot do the uh, transfer. So you have prepared this one cycle before and expecting the results of this PRP for subsequent because naturally you will not do the transfer in the same cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. Transfer is not done in that cycle. Transfer yeah. is done in two cycles, two cycles or maybe three cycles when the endometrium starts growing well. You have prepared okay. endometrium. Okay. So what we do is... So not, not the same cycle. That's uh -huh. not it. Uh, so what we do and what our publication is in the same cycle, how you do the GCSF very gently, but we take an embryo transfer catheter under ultrasonographic guidance, Give uh, take only 0.5 ml and uh, I use a Cook's embryo transfer catheter. So all those embryo transfer catheter, we keep a ETO ready and we take that one millimeter endometrial transfer uh, catheter, inner catheter, and we pass it at the fundus under sonographic control and keep on depositing this PRP and come out. You don't have to cancel the cycle. In the same cycle, you can do. Now, usually, we suppose previous cycle has canceled, then on day nine or day 12, we do these PRPs. And then the same, you find a beautiful vascularity coming up, your score uh, of a vascularity raising to five. So same cycle PRP also can be performed. In fact, my st study of 68 cases is the same cycle I have done the embryo transfer. Um, any role of uh, endometrial scratching? Uh, see, uh, this is, I don't know whether endometrial scratching will improve the thin endometrium, but definitely by release of the, it is non-infective inflammatory reaction, which it will cause, may help in the implantation in subsequent cycle. And that is why hysteroscopy, which we do pre-IVF hysteroscopy, probably during that time with the telescope, only we scratch out all the endometrium. So this is... So this is a novel idea, but what happens, you know, uh, I feel Narendra, if you have to do two cycles prior and all, the amount of PRP needed is very high and you need to really take out 40 to 60 cc of blood uh, for that PRP. Because many a time I have done a stem cell and second sitting instead of stem cells, I want to do PRP. The video which I have shown, I take out 50 cc of a blood and we prepare then PRP around 10 to 12 cc, you can generate that PRP. So you need a large volume of a blood to prepare, uh, to put it hysteroscopically through that needle. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much. You are doing such an amazing job, dear. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you uh, to all the experts for their lovely comments and uh, so nicely clearing everybody's doubts. I'm sure uh, nice to see you. I met you in Panvel. Yes, ma'am. It's been, I think, two years. <laughs> Love to see you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Narendra. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I would now like, the doc if the Dr. Girija, madam, is still here with us, I would uh, uh, like her to introduce, it would be great if she could introduce our next speaker for the day, Dr. Parikshit Tank. Uh, Girija, yes. madam, are you there? Yeah, you? I am there, Anshu. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for giving me this opportunity of introducing Dr. Parikshit Tank. Another, uh, now I think... Uh, he has gone into the category of being the older Hello. young man, not really a very young person, but a very, very Hello. experienced and an accomplished fertility specialist and a doctor. Hello. Sunita, can Sorry, you beta. mute yourself? Sunita, please mute yourself. Sunita, yes. Hello, so Sunita. Hi, ma'am. I'm so sorry. The, Sunita, uh, please mute. Sunita, your, please uh, mute. Uh, please Sunita. mute. Delayed Sunita. and uh, unfortunately, I have to read. <laughs> Sunita, all secret conversation we are hearing. <laughs> okay. So, Dr. Parikshit is a consultant at the Ashwini Maternity and Surgical Hospital and Center for Endoscopy and Assisted Reproduction, Mumbai and also at the Jupiter Hospital Sthane, an honorary professor, Pacific Medical College, Udaipur, consultant for assisted reproduction at 16 centers, treasurer of FOXI, chairperson, safe motherhood committee, FOXI 2014-17, 
PG teacher and examiner, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Mumbai, examiner for the MRCOG Part 3, managing committee member, Mumbai Obijwain Society. He, also has has been awarded by, he has been awarded with many awards and most importantly, many publications. And I always see him somewhere editing some book all the time where I'm made to contribute some chapter. <laughs> 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 Uh, thank you, thank you. That's that's indeed a introduction coming from somebody who's uh, who has been bothered enough by me. <laughs> no, no, no. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Giri Javag. Always a pleasure to see you. And uh, if I may be allowed to share my screen, uh, we can get this session started. At the outset, uh, my congratulations and thanks to Neharika. Uh, one of the most dynamic young people I've seen in Foxy, and she's gathered some absolutely brilliant stars around you, uh, her. And that includes all the conveners who are taking part in today's program. So well done, Neharika, and uh, all the coordinators. Uh, I can see Priyankur and uh, some of the other ones are also there. Um, wonderful job getting all of us together. And uh, I must thank Ambrosia because uh, they facilitated this interaction that we are enjoying today. So, uh, you know, starting with the most existential questions, are my slides seen? Yes, yes sir, we can see them. Yes, okay, sir. I'm taking it to slide show and uh, hopefully they will continue to be seen. Am I so, audible? Uh, Am I visible? Yes, sir, we can see you. Yeah, great. Okay. So uh, I've been asked to speak about ovulation induction, uh, tips and tricks. And uh, you know, whenever I get a topic which is titled in this way, one always wonders where to start because you know, ovulation induction is, is huge. I mean, uh, there are literally books which have been published about this. So I went and uh, just Googled for uh, getting my thought process started. What are tips and tricks? So tips, that's something positive. That means advice or a useful hint. But trick means something that is used to fool somebody. And one thing I've realized with uh, approximately two decades of ovarian stimulation is you can't trick the ovaries. You may take some tips from today's talk, but there are no tricks. So the good news is that this talk will cover everything, but it won't cover everything about ovulation induction. It will be a quick, very quick tips and some helpful points. And by the very nature of making it uh, only tips, I assure you that I will finish in time. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news, as I said, there are no tricks. So you have to go down the straight road only. And only experience teaches you the tips that you will always remember. So you have to be patient. You have to learn. I hope what I say today might help you in your practice. But long term, it's a process of learning, unlearning, and learning again. So tip number one is... Sorry, uh, Parikshit, sir. Your slides are not moving. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's not on slideshow. Slide slide it's not on slideshow. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll go back to slideshow and see where. Okay. How's this? Yes, yes sir. Yeah, yes, sir. That's good. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Uh, now the slides are moving and they are seen, right? Yeah, tip one. Yes, sir. yes, okay, excellent. So I thought, uh, you know, we should uh, begin with the beginning, and that is Socratic wisdom. And that is know thyself. When I say know thyself in tip number one, what I mean is you have to know what's the clinical situation. You have to have clear intent, means irada. So what are you stimulating for? Are you stimulating for an where your goal is monofollicular uh, or multifollicular ovulation? 
are you stimulating because you're doing an assisted reproduction cycle with the intention that you will do embryo transfer that cycle or are you stimulating in an art cycle with no intention whatsoever to do an embryo transfer and you're quite certain that this is a typical pcos for example whom you're going to freeze all or this is a very poor responder from for whom you're going to do a pooling strategy so what is the goal of the ovarian stimulation is something that has to be decided much before you touch an injection tip number 2 is expectations and as you can see from the diagram expectations and satisfaction they sometimes go in opposite directions and that is the source of grief so assess the ovarian reserve be realistic about what to expect counsel the couple about the expected outcomes and you know when there is some kind of synchrony in the expectations and what you are likely to achieve only after that you start stimulation until then don't be in a rush to get this patient into the system so what's the rule of thumb for assessing ovarian reserve i mean there are plenty of systems and criteria and so on and so forth but this is a simple way of doing it and of course there can be infinite combinations i mean you could have a young woman with a low afc and a low amh you could have an older woman with pcos and a high amh so on and so forth but this is uh, you know broad categories to help you get started so typically high responders are young ones with a high afc high amh low responders over 35 afc 4 to 7 amh 1 to 3 and then of course you have the very low responders or decreased ovarian reserve which dr jatin shah so beautifully elaborated on and uh, that's uh, something you can consider as a completely separate category so you got these two extremes and then everyone else who falls in between so having grouped them you now have a better idea about what to counsel them about tip number 3 when it comes to ovarian stimulation is that we are in resource limitedness biological resources are finite and human reproduction is a thoroughly inefficient process so we have to do what we have to do with these limitations in mind in view and we have to understand that there is nothing in the wide world that will make a woman who has depleted her oocytes uh, become a great responder she might become from zero responder she might become a very poor responder but there's uh, just sometimes a numerical change i mean it's not really a huge biological or a huge clinical change that you can affect so as i said you know typically you are going to have a lot of biological wastage and from that broad uh inverted base of the number of follicles you start coning down and therefore you come to a reasonable number of embryos that you can transfer so that is the whole basis of why we need ovarian stimulation in ivf in the first place tip number 4 is control what you can see there are things in life and in ovarian stimulation that matter and there are things that you can control and that is a small area which overlaps like this venn diagram and that is exactly the part that you can control and you can focus on so what are those things which you can assure to like say 99% it's the external factors so ensure a regular supply chain of drugs order good quality drugs don't compromise on that see that the cold chain is maintained from start to finish teach administration don't take it for granted if you have a new staff member who may be a qualified nurse don't assume that she knows how to inject gonadotropins correctly if you have a doctor who is taking gonadotropins home please do not presume that she or the husband he will know how to do it 
please teach them in the first go and then of course almost everybody can manage injections on their own especially subcutaneous ones document and cross check to see that all these external factors are controlled and there are no drug administration errors tip number 5 is kiss keep it simple students so here what i would advise especially youngsters who are getting started is have a simple set protocols for the standard clinical situations that you are going to come across so i told you how you can group women into low normal or high responders have some kind of set protocol assess these protocols for yourself how is this working in my clinic in my clinical settings am i getting results and if you are getting reasonable results please stick to that set protocol if you are convinced that a protocol works don't change it unless you find something very overwhelming very new very novel and very useful don't change the protocol that you are comfortable with jumping from one protocol to other in ovarian stimulation is a recipe for disaster because you will not master any known protocol and you will keep making a porridge out of everything tip number 6 is the similarity of gonadotropins as they say in africa there are 40 kinds of lunacy but only one kind of common sense there are many types of gonadotropins but ovarian response remains more or less the same and the market is flooded with gonadotropins more varieties are emerging every day so how do you choose my ranking uh, criteria are one feasibility is that gonadotropin available regularly or not two economy and three is biology so these are all the different types of gonadotropins which are available we are aware that gonadotropins either can be urinary or recombinant urinary depending on the extent to which they are purified one may have an fsh lh ratio of 1 is to 1 which is the conventional menotropin or hmg where you have a little more protein contamination and it has to be administered intramuscularly these are the most cost effective gonadotropins that you can find in the market if you do a little more purification you have urifolitropins and hp fsh which have lesser and lesser components of lh and protein contamination but as you can see the price keeps rising and then of course you have recombinant fsh and biosimilar fsh which has only fsh it can be administered subcutaneously it gives you the convenience of administration but it comes at a price nearly twice of what an ordinary hmg is going to cost this woman uh similarly you've got various uh, types of hcg also urinary hcg recombinant hcg and you have recombinant lh which i call the wonder molecule why do i call the wonder molecule do you know because i'm still wondering what should i do with it if i want lh activity i'll use hmg if i want fsh activity i'll use recombinant fsh where does this fit into the picture we'll find out i don't know maybe low responders could be possible role so now we know with the mega set trial that hmg versus recombinant fsh this was a huge trial randomized across 25 centers non programmed antagonist cycles single day 5 blast transfer in the fresh or the subsequent thaw cycle and if you see the blue bars and the green bars everywhere it's almost the same some places many places i would say the blue bars that is hmg seems to be inching ahead of recombinant fsh this just goes on to prove the non inferiority of hmg in the entire process of ovarian stimulation so more expensive does not necessarily mean better which gonadotropin at the end of the day 
the conclusion is very clear that all of them are equally effective at inducing ovulation and there are no difference in pregnancy rates. This is from the Cochrane database. So the choice of therapy is dictated by logistic factors, cost, administration, ease, etc., rather than biochemical or medical ones. Now, when I say this, I'm often asked that if there is a woman who has PCOS and you're going to use HMG, you're bombing her with more LH. So my question is very simple. I mean, how much uh, HMG are you going to use every day? 200 units, 250 units, something like that. That's what gets diluted in five, five and a half liters of blood volume. And what will happen to the LH level from say 10, for example, the LH level will go to 11. So what? Big deal. It doesn't matter. So in low responders, recombinant products might have an edge because there is a consistency of dosing. And maybe, just maybe, as I alluded to earlier, LH might have a role over here. But exactly who is going to benefit from these is a challenge. So for the moment, I would again emphasize that all gonadotropins work almost the same. Tip seven is well begun is half done because we have to understand the physiology of the recruitment window. You cannot get new follicles into the system once the recruitment window is closed. So the single most important iatrogenic determinant of what kind of oocyte cohort you're going to have in IVF is the starting dose. If you get the starting dose right, you can sleep for the next 8-10 days and the follicles will just grow on their own. If you get the starting dose wrong, do what you want, you will not be able to change the outcome of the cycle. So the starting dose is going to work because of the recruitment window, day 2 to day 6. After that, say you find that the response is low, would increasing the dose of the gonadotropin change anything? Probably not. Nothing will change. The follicles will just grow faster. So you're going to have your lead follicle maturing on day 8 instead of the usual day 10. That's about it. You're going to do the pickup a little sooner, but you're not going to get many more extra follicles if you faltered with the starting dose. So in case you think that the starting dose has not worked in the way it was supposed to, it might be a reasonable option to just call it quits in that cycle and then come back in another month for another uh, fresh approach with the stimulation. So what should be the starting dose? If you've got a high responder, 225 HMG or 150 rec, rec FSH, normal 300-200, low responder 450-300. Are these written in stone? Of course not. I mean, this is what you gain by experience. I mean, you'll have a day when you think somebody is a low responder, but she lands up with nearly an OHSS. So all these things are going to teach you how to calibrate your dose. And this will happen only as you keep doing ovarian stimulation. But you have to remember to keep learning from the experience of ovarian stimulation. Tip number eight, to agonize or antagonize. I mean, we need down regulation because we don't want premature ovulation and we do not want a premature rise in LH, which can lead to a rise in progesterone and ruin the endometrium. So we need down regulation in some way. And either we can use agonists, typically in the long protocol, or we can use antagonists. Over a period of time, more and more and more cycles are becoming antagonist cycles. And this is fairly strongly supported in literature because the antagonist cycle has been evaluated in two large meta-analysis and there was no difference in the probability of live birth, especially for normal and low responders. Uh, if you look at the meta-analysis, one very, very important aspect of antagonist use came out. That is a reduced requirement of gonadotropins, a lower incidence of OHSS in the antagonist group. 
So if you look at the typical long protocol, you start on day 21 in the previous cycle and start the agonist, so on and so forth. Then the period comes, you continue the agonist. And that's how we did ovarian stimulation for years. But look at the simplicity of the antagonist protocol. Don't do anything until the period comes. Get going with the gonadotropins. Day six of stimulation, just add the antagonist. Nothing much to think about. And this is what the standard ovarian stimulation protocol looks like today. I used to joke a few years back that, uh, you know, my daughter is eight years old. She has just become fluent with, uh, you know, understanding simple things. And if I give this chart to her and tell her, go sit in the clinic and do ovarian stimulation, she'll also do it. But now I can't say that because she's 13 and she thinks she's smarter than me. So she is the one who will give me advice. I'm still following the standard protocol, what is established today. Tip number nine, what is the trigger? And here we need to have a mindset of having OHSS free clinics. If you have you know, the slightest of doubts that this woman might land up with moderate OHSS or more, that means she's making 12, 15 follicles please just avoid HCG. And this applies, of course, only to antagonist cycles. Only in antagonist cycles, you have the luxury of triggering with agonist. In this kind of a situation, don't even bother with a dual trigger or anything of that sort. Just do an agonist trigger, freeze all, come back another day when the ovaries have settled down. Today, cryopreservation is fantastic. I mean, the type of recoveries that we get from embryos is great. So there's no question of biological loss at that stage. So don't take any risk whatsoever and play it safe. The trigger is what we call the stop loss. That's where you cut your losses of ovarian hyperstimulation and make sure that the woman is safe. Tip number 10, uh, being a cricket fan, I couldn't resist this, batches win matches. And we work with this concept of creating batches of patients who are undergoing assisted reproduction. The advantage is it's an optimal resource usage, economic advantage of medium use is there. It's focused activity. But of course, uh, it needs to be planned in very granular detail because a single event malfunction can ruin the whole batch. So, very, very carefully, you can do batches. And this is typically the kind of schedule that we make uh, because it's so predictable. And you can use oral contraceptive pills to schedule cycles. Now, the important thing that I would like to point out is this. You have to stop the oral contraceptive pill seven days before you start stimulation. Please remember this. And by giving this washout, of oral contraceptive pills, you are going to completely negate whatever effects the pill has on the endometrium and your results are not going to be affected by pill use. So this is a brilliant method by which you can schedule your ovarian stimulation. So with that, I come to the end of today's tips and tricks. I'm sure there's so much more to discuss in ovarian stimulation, but considering that uh, I'm the last but one speaker and we are pushing the time, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Neharika. Thank you so much, Parikshit, uh, sir. Can we have comments from our experts on this excellent talk? I think, uh, Par Parikshit, you have, you have done an excellent job. I think uh, more than the conventional year talk from your experience, from your mind, that, that clearly it shows the how for sincerely you are done to the point. Thank you, Fessy. Uh, Malutra, sir, if he's here, can we have a few comments from sir as well? Aruna, madam, is also here. Uh, Madam, please uh, share a few comments on the sir's lecture. It was really quite brilliant. Excellent talk, sir. You thank you. Thank you, Dr. So many tips and tricks. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Is there any questions in the chat box? 
I, I request all the experts to answer the questions. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, and again, there is, is there any role of growth hormone in thin endometrium? If yes, then do it in doses. Uh, we'll take so this. I think, uh, was... I think we can take it at the end. Probably. I'm going to type okay. the answers here so that we'll go to the next talk. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, then can we have a chairperson introduce uh, the next speaker who does not need any introduction, to be honest. But can I have, have an introduction of Dr. Nahon Malhotra, sir, please? Can I introduce, sir? Yes, Only sir. Only one line, yes. please. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> that, next speaker possible, is, uh, doesn't need any introduction, not only in India, even uh, around the world. Thank you. Uh, I Thank think you. it is uh, none other than Professor Narendra Malhotra. Uh, SAR is the Managing Director of Global Rainbow Healthcare uh, Hospitals, Director of Air Rainbow IVF, Director of Mianada CAC, Director of Project Positive Health uh, Lottery District 3110, Director of International Relations Support, Director of Ian Donald Ultrasound, Professor Sanjeev School of Science and Technology, Croatia, Professor of, of, of Croatia University, mm. President in SAR, Past President Sapog and uh, Wapim, and immediate Past President Rotary Club of uh, Agra, Taj uh, City, and Past Presidents of ISA, Rispat, Foxy, and uh, and uh, other organizations. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I think if you start to uh, tell about SAR achievement, it will be thank you, thank it you. will take uh, one long. But just to summarize, SAR is an expert. Uh, who can share his uh, values, uh, his views about, and whenever each talk, whenever he does the new talks, all are eager to hear that because we will be having new new information, which is not only theoretical, but the practical aspects we can get from you. Over to you, sir. Can I, can you allow me to share slides? Please, huh. thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I'm the last speaker and I uh, have to keep all of you occupied and interested in a topic which has been discussed since morning. So, what we're going to tell you now is uh, you've heard about nutraceuticals, it's nutrition and pharmaceuticals. So, let's see if we can have uh, how these have been packaged innovatively for fertility or for infertility. And uh, I'll try to take you through some of the diets and through some of the preparations which we have. We all uh, have to be very familiar with what is fertility, what is infertility, what is female fertility, which is, involves a lot of factors, and what is male infertility, which also involves a lot of factors. And all these could be related to diet. So infertility is an increasing problem which is affecting the couples attempting pregnancy. And there's a huge amount of growing evidence points. When you search Google, you will see so many papers on female uh, diet and fertility. Fertility boosting foods, fertility boosting diets. So the data shows that high diet high in trans fat, refined carbohydrates, added sugars can negatively affect infertility. And a diet which is known as a Mediterranean diet, which is rich in fiber, omega-3, fatty acids, plant-based proteins, vitamins, will have a positive impact. So unhealthy diet like this can disturb your microbiota and uh, cause infertility. But there is less lack of evidence that gluten, a lot of people are excluding gluten from the diet so to become pregnant. Now that is only if you don't have celiac disease, gluten is not a negative factor. Furthermore, a lot of people said stop drinking at all. So the good news is for drinkers, well, um, Alcohol in recommended amounts also does not seem to affect fertility. But on the other hand, phytoestrogens presumably have a positive influence in on fertility. So that then um, it's not only the diet, it's a complete lifestyle. And the lifestyle includes diet and physical activity, psychological stress, socioeconomic stress, BMI, smoking, alcohol, caffeine, psychoactive substances in context to fertility. And uh, of course, the nutrition stress. Nut so your lifestyle uh, style of these pe people have to be told before getting pregnant to 
keep a check on their caloric intake and compose a diet in terms of vitamins, proteins, lipids, a balanced diet, especially in those who are suffering from inflammatory diseases like endometriosis and like ovulation disorders. And that is my tip for in added to one of the 10 tips told to you, the 11th tip or maybe the first tip is proper diet and proper exercise for ovulation. When you do a literature, literature search, what we did in PubMed is for the for fertility, fertility diet, female fertility, PCOS, endometriosis, infertility and fertility, we got get huge amount of tips to improve egg quality, to improve semen quality, to see even, even religious tips for uh, improving the quality. So nutrition can help in every infertility aspect except for tubal block. And that also tubal block because of inflammation probably uh, uh, good diet and nutrition can help. So endometriosis, ovulatory dysfunction, PCOS and PCOD, they're different. Male problems, unexplained, oligospermia, sexual dysfunctions. You need multivitamins, you need CoQ10, you need l -arginine, you need Moringa, you need probiotics, you need antioxidants, you need correct amino acids, leucine and glutathione, shitavri, ashwagandha, etc., etc., which were told to you in the first talk, if you remember the first talk by now, because it's gone quite late. And of course, the dietary habits. So now this study, which we are going to present or uh, review for you is, from US and it studied two types of diet, the Mediterranean diet and the Western diet. The Mediterranean diet, MED as it is called as, it is characterized by consumption of vegetables, fruits, olive oil, unrefined carbohydrates, low fat dairy, poultry, fish, red wine, and low consumption of red meat and simple sugars. So this diet was shown to help and it, this diet was uh, put given to ART patients to infertility patients trying to conceive in a very large cohort study. And this showed that this is what is a pro-fertility diet. And probably all of them should be put in, onto this diet. So pro-fertility diet is, is a diet which is shows you trans fatty acids, high consumption of MU, FAs, plant-derived uh, proteins, decreased consumption, uh, consumption of animal and uh, glycemic foods. So women following the pro-fertility diets consume non, more of non-heme iron and at least three times a week took multivitamins, especially B vitamins, folic acids, and moderate amount or recommended less than recommended amount of alcohol and coffee and were very physically active. While the Western diet, on the other hand, the American diet, which we call is, is simply carbohydrate, sugar, sweets, Sweetened beverages, red processed meats, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which you can see as this uh, this uh, lady is gulping, and this is what we call that as the junk food. And this high caloric food is detrimental to fertility. So it is shown that diet which is high glycemic index, rich in animal protein, uh, was discussed in this paper, like good paper which we have just reviewed in the last couple of slides for you. Now, when again you do a search on what supplements should I take, you get a whole lot, a lot of tips, you get, get a whole lot of pictures, you get a whole lot of things on supplements. So there's a wealth of evidence for both male and in female infertility on what appropriate nutraceutical should be supplemented uh, by for improving the ART and for improving the fertility of the woman. So there are him diets, there are her diets, there are both avoids and are both taking and keeping also certain religions in mind. So they, this was, and then there are tips and trips for home remedies and tips to improve the egg quality, etc. So all this is required. Now I'm taking you through all this is because this is the amount of food a uh, uh, infertile patient or everyone for their good healthy life should be eating. Now, it's not possible. Remember that the cause of aging and internal disease is oxidative stress, as was stressed by the first speaker, or which leads to hormonal disbalance and which leads to deficiency in vital nutrients and micronutrients. And this is what has to be addressed by a good diet. And if there is no proper good diet, or even if there is good diet in this uh, era, 
it has to be supplemented by nutraceuticals. So what nutraceuticals? Coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10 improves the ovarian response and the embryo quality that is well known. Omega-3 fatty acids, shown by lots of study in animals that omega-3 fatty acid is very, very good for infant. Selenium, again, a lots and lots of study and literature showing that selenium in nutraceuticals is very important. Lycopene, very powerful antioxidants, anti-inflammatory and deteriorating oocyte quality has a better conception rate in those patients, aged patients who are supplemented with lycopene. Vitamin D, no doubts about the use of vi vitamin D pre-fertility during pregnancy and even during the postpartum period. The new herb is the Moringa herb. Moringa herb also has a, a very, very important antioxidant and has enormous benefits for, benefits for health. And if you compare it with other fruits, it is a very, very strong antioxidant as compared to a lot of fruits and vegetables. Probiotics, this is a great paper which Niharika presented in probiotics. Probiotics is not only work, going to work for infertility, it works for complete lifestyle. And it improves your from oral health to coronary heart disease, to parasitic infections, to diarrhea, to reduction of blood pressure, UTIs, everything. So all these have been grouped by uh, this company, Ambriosa, into uh, innovative solutions for fertility. And for male infertility, we have UBQHR. So ubiquinone with resveratrol, anti-aging and for male, improves sperm quality. And we have Revita LYF, which is like a spray. So first time I've seen that in antioxidants in a spray. So it goes the past, we'll go through them. And for female infertility, of course, you have the UBQRH again. For poor responders with low AMH, and for PCOS, protosol powder, which also causes weight loss and can be given to weight loss, and Seminova, which is now uh, the latest one there. So what does these innovations contain? Now, the innovation is that all which is essential should be put into the correct amount and quantity in a, and package it so that the compliance of taking it is. So if you, if you look at Seminova, it has amino acids which are necessary, arginine, leucine, glutathione anti-aging, anti, and improving the oocyte quality, improving the embryo quality, improving the endometrial. Shatavari and ashwagandha, so sexual um, improvement, and uh, ashwagandha uh, is being used for health and anti -aging. So L-leucine, um, uh, maturation for eggs, glutathione, reduces oxidative stress. Shatavari protects the egg, egg from ROS. And with a modern life of stress, all these need to be supplemented to correct the hypothalamic uh, pituitary ovarian axis and balance the endocrine of the woman so that she goes normal. So this also helps in improving the blood flow because L-arginine has been shown and balancing the hormones, especially the heat. Glutathione is a very, very powerful antioxidant, very, very powerful anti-aging. And if you're not taking glutathione, all of you start taking it. It can be taken orally, powder, liquid or even injected IV uh, every three months. Shatavri and, and all the herbs which we use are all adaptogenic. These are all given to us. Uh, when we, and see, this is then to show that uh, innovative package works, you have to need studies. So now we have studies from this from our center in Agra for uh, thin endometrium and I explained infertility. Uh, which the results are going to soon come out. And then and there's another two IVF centers in Delhi who are doing a study on Seminova uh, for, and seeing that after a use for two months, it improves. The second combination, which I like very much, which can be used again, not only infertility, but can be used by men and women, both for anti-aging, ubiquinol. Now, CoQ10, uh, uh, ubiquinol is a reduced form of CoQ10. So if you take CoQ10, then it has to go into your body and get metabolized and reduced to ubiquinol. And if you take it directly, it works much better. So it's a very, very good antioxidant at the mitochondrial level. Uh, resveratrol is again an anti-aging agent and repairs the DNA. See, we have the DNA and the end of the DNA is the telomeres. And if you, your telomeres are bad or short, then uh, you will age fast and ovarian aging is also there. So we need some drug, something to repair it. And again, this is a study which we presented 
from our center with by Dr. Keshav for on male infertility with the improvement of sperm count, motility, and morphology in idiopathic uh, male oligo uh, is a So, and there are a lot of feedbacks, and these feedbacks also matter, though they are uh, they are clinical uh, anecdotes and feedbacks. They are not backed by studies, but they need to be backed. Then we have this uh, great powder which is packaged, which has pea protein, inositol, folic acid, vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, and 25 other vitamins, which we have all been talking to you since the first talk. Dr. Nandita has showed you that how, how all the 25 vitamins are needed. So this study was done by Dr. Niharika uh, on 123 patients. And we found that out of them, 101 had a weight loss of one to two kgs within two months. The prolonged cycles got corrected uh, with the weight loss. And with this, the acne improved, the hirsutism improved, the fasting blood sugar levels improved, and pre-IVF and pre-IUI, IUI the success improved. So this, this is again a published study with it. So PCOS, which have a bad endocrine profile, you need myoinositol in the correct dose and you need multivitamins and vitamin D with it. So that is where it works. So it works to correct the metabolic Im imbalance, correct the proteins because it is required for insulin sensitizing and you uh, supplement it with all the vitamins uh, along with it. Now, this is the thing which was uh, got me very excited. Revita L leaf, sublingual spray. Now, this sublingual spray, spray con con contains uh, astaxanthin, lutathion, ashwagandha, selenium. And see, it is logical. If you have something sublingual, it goes straight into the blood and will have no pass, uh, first pass metabolism. So this, all the things uh, in this, especially astaxanthin, is a very, very strong antioxidant. And this will again help in uh, improving sperm quality and in reducing the scavenger hydrogen peroxide, which is uh, the reactive oxygen species. So this is will cause improvement. Ashwagandha is antioxidants and clinical trials are already there. Nothing to say about Ashwagandha. It is a good health tonic to take for everyone. Selenium, we've been talking about selenium a lot. It is again very important. So ladies and gentlemen, take home points are from the whole webinar today that good nutrition is essential. But it is not possible to eat enough food to get all that good nutrition in therapeutic levels. So diet is not enough, but it is very essential to have a correct diet. So you need to have supplementation for your health, for your aging, and for infertility. And now we, with the nutraceutical market increasing and increasing, as, and uh, it is non-licensed, so you don't have to take a drug permission to market nutraceuticals. They are a little expensive, but that's okay if they're providing benefit. So innovative combinations have come in nutraceuticals and all, everyone is mixing everything uh, to get the correct. So all these need to be backed by Indian studies and Indian trials. So all of you, I would urge on youngsters who are logged in, do a trial on your 10, 20 cases, pull up all the data and let's come out with a good nutraceutical trial, uh, which we tried in our centers. So PCOS, endometriosis, anovulation, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian factors, male factors, and unexplained infertility, pre-IVF, pre-IUI, all of them need good nutrition supplement, good diet, and good nutraceutical. The future of medical treatment and health and well-being is not pills, it is nutrition. And nutraceutical is the answer to cure many diseases. Innovative combinations are not now available, and we need to supplement our, ourselves uh, for health and infertile patients. So it's not only eating well, it is complete lifestyle which, which is needed for a good fertile fertility to be maintained, which will include fruits, exercises, water, peace of mind, eat well, walk, meditate, and read spiritual books, and be happy. That's the mix. Thank you very, very much uh, for inviting me here to express some of my thoughts on innovative uh, combinations of nutraceuticals, uh, which are now available to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It is really uh, incredible how uh, well you've managed to consolidate all this information in such a small time. So thank you so much. And it is we always look forward to your wonderful talks. Uh, can we have our experts and chairpersons with a few comments on the uh, this wonderful talk? 
please can you add point actually i just wanted to say that i am feeling very very happy today that we are speaking about nutraceuticals in a big way because i think that's where the world is going if you look at the koreans and if you look at people in our own himachal in the well valleys we all see that many of the foods which they are consuming are such natural foods which are helping anti aging and that's where somewhere is going to link up with our fertility issues to optimizing the dna synthesis and trying to reduce even the abnormalities that we are encountering today in a large quantity and maybe they would also act as you know environmental toxin busters because that's another challenge that we are having and therefore i think with a combination of wisdom which comes from dr jaydeep malhotra when she speaks about environmental uh, pollutants affecting our health at large and then dr narendra telling us about nutraceuticals and how we can improvise i think that's going to be a win win situation for all of us to take inspiration from my message would definitely will always be that before embarking on all those wonderful expensive infertility assisted reproductive technologies please optimize the women's dietary practices and health very very important because we are having such such rampant occurrence of trisomies aneuploidies right now in our practices abnormalities in their outcomes perinatal outcomes are there and i feel when we are doing liver transplant surgery when we do so many other transplants we are doing so much of investigation and optimization so why not when we are doing embryo transplant we must think of that also thank you and congratulations neharika there and sir i think that the topic was so relevant because now we are get lot of lot of patients especially pco patients obese patients and and the diet i mean right i mean people confused with the diet and when they come for art or infertility treatment they routinely ask what is the uh, what are the key things what we have to do or how we can improve our diet modifications i think this mediterranean diet which you are told is very uh, informative thing is uh, pro fertility diet and also the the uh, uh, nutraceutical supplements what we are told that that is really insight to the Uh, to all those who are all who are into this uh, in fertility management thank you so much sir uh, dr neharika uh, do we have time for questions or should we move on to we'll the we'll wind up the session now anshu and uh... all right i think narendra sir had to leave for yeah. an emergency we really thank you thanks sir for his time and patience and he was with us throughout the whole session and he concluded this uh, session wonderfully now i would like to invite dr neharika who is a pioneer for this and uh, to con conclude and give the vote of thanks thank you dear anshu and i am feeling so grateful that i had so many stalwarts and experts for today's webinar and each one of them has done justice to the topic which was given we had so many comments from on youtube on uh, our zoom platform congratulating our speakers i truly thank shanta kumari madam for giving us this opportunity special thanks to dr jaydeep malhotra and dr pai sir for being here with us also thanks to all my faculty dr sunita dr parikshit dr nandita dr jatin dr sanjeeva dr arshna bse dr girija ma'am dr amaya dr narain dr fessi and dr aruna for gracing today's occasion and giving us such expert comments i cannot do anything without my team my team is my strength and i thank my coordinators for today's session shaila rohan priyankur prerna and anshu thank you special thanks to team ambrosia for being with us and also to ravi for coordinating everything thank you everyone and a good night i invite uh, mr ramesh to say a few words before we end this session so you are on mute mode sir okay thanks a lot uh, dr niharika for giving us this opportunity to arrange this as this webinar thanks to all the dignitaries the faculty who took that out very little time and speak so highly and knowledgeable about the nutraceutical and last but not least all i like to thank all the uh, delegates who attended this without which the webinar would not have been a success i had made some presentation but i will not bore you with more slides 
I think whatever I wanted to say, all the previous doctors have already spoken. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, madam. Thanks, Dr. Niharika. And looking forward to for such kind of webinars in future ahead. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Thank you, Niharika. Bye bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Girija ma'am. Fessy sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night.